Chapter Ten of Book Ten of Metaphysics by Aristotle, translated by John McMahon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Chapter Ten. But the infinite either is that which it is impossible to pass through in respect of its not being adapted by nature to be permeated in the same way as the voice is invisible or it is that which possesses a passage without an end or that which is scarcely so or that which by nature is adapted to have but has not a passage or termination further a thing is infinite from subsisting by addition or subtraction or both it is indeed possible therefore that the infinite should constitute a certain entity that involves a separable subsistence but that it is cognizant by sense is not possible for if it constitutes neither magnitude nor multitude and if the infinite be a substance and not an accident of this it will be indivisible for that which is divisible amounts either to magnitude or multitude but if it be indivisible it will not be infinite unless in the same way as the voice is invisible they do not however say so nor do we inquire into the subject but we consider it as a thing without any passage or in other words impermeable further let me ask how is it possible that what is essentially infinite should exist unless there should happen to subsist number and magnitude of which too the infinite is a passive condition moreover if the infinite subsists according to accident it would not constitute an element of entities as far forth as it is a thing that is infinite in the same manner as neither is that which is invisible an element of speech although the voice is invisible and that it is not possible for the infinite to subsist in energy is evident for any part whatsoever of itself that is assumed will be infinite for the being of the infinite and a thing which is infinite are the same if the infinite be substance and not that which is predicated of a subject wherefore it is either indivisible or divisible in a progression ad infinitum if it be made up of parts that are or may be divisible that many infinites however should be the same thing is impossible for as air is a part of air so infinite is a part of that which is infinite if it is substance and a first principle the infinite then is devoid of parts and indivisible but it is impossible that an entity that subsists in actuality should be infinite for it must needs constitute quantity it subsists then according to accident but if this be the case it has been declared that it is not possible that it should be a first principle but this must be affirmed of that to which it happens that number or evenness should be such the investigation therefore is itself universal that the infinite however does not subsist in things that are cognizant by sense is evident from the following circumstances for on the supposition that the definition of body amounts to that which is bounded by surfaces body would not be infinite either that which is cognizable by sense or by the understanding nor will it be number as actually separated and infinite for number is that which is numerable or which involves number that the infinite however cannot subsist in things cognizant to the senses regarded in a physical point of view is evident from these following reasons for neither is it possible that it should be a composite nature nor one which is simple for if you admit that it is a composite nature it will not be a body if the elements are limited in multitude for it is requisite that we should equalize the contraries and that one of them should not be infinite 
for if in any degree whatsoever the potentiality of the other body fails the finite will be corrupted by the infinite body but it is impossible that each of the elements should be infinite for body is that which in every direction involves an interval but that which is infinite is that which involves an interval without end wherefore if there is in existence an infinite body it will be infinite in every direction neither however can there be in existence one infinite simple body nor as certain philosophers would lay down can it subsist as different from or independent of the elements from whence they generate these things for there is not in existence a body of this description beside the elements for all those things of which they are compounded are resolved into these this however does not appear to subsist beside the simple bodies either fire or any other of the elements for without some one of them being infinite it is impossible that the universe if it may be finite should either be or be generated from some one of the elements as heraclitus says that all things were originally fire and there is the same mode of reasoning also in the case of unity the existence of which natural philosophers introduce besides the elements for everything undergoes a change from its contrary as from heat into cold further a body cognizant by the senses is situated in a certain place and there is the same place of the whole as of the part of the earth for instance as of one of its clods wherefore if the infinite be of similar parts indeed it will be immovable or always will be impelled forwards but this is impossible for why may i ask should it be moved downwards in preference to upwards or in any direction whatsoever for instance if it were a clod of earth in what direction will this be moved or in what place will it remain at rest for the place of the body naturally adapted to this will be infinite will it then comprise the entire place and how will this be so what therefore will be its place of rest and its motion or shall we say that it will remain at rest everywhere it will not then be moved or shall we say that it will be moved in every direction it will not then stand still if the universe however be of dissimilar parts places likewise would be dissimilar and in the first instance no doubt the body of the universe would not be one save in respect of contact in the next place these things will be either finite or infinite in species that they should be finite is not certainly then possible for some indeed will be infinite and some not so on the supposition that the universe is infinite for instance fire or water and a thing of this kind will be corruption to contraries if however they are infinite and simple both the places will be infinite and infinite will be the elements but if this is impossible and the places be finite in number the universe also must needs be finite and in general it is impossible that there can be an infinite body and a place for bodies if every body that is cognizant by the senses involves gravity or lightness for it will have an impulse either towards the centre or upwards it is impossible however that the infinite either the whole or the half or any part whatsoever should undergo a passive state for in what way would you make a division of it or of the infinite how will there be one portion tending in a direction downwards and the other in a direction upwards or how will this constitute the extremity and that the centre further every body that falls under the notice of the senses subsists in place and there are six species of place but it is impossible that these should subsist in a body that is infinite and upon the whole 
if it is impossible that place should be infinite it is likewise impossible that body should be so for that which subsists in place is somewhere and this signifies a direction either upwards or downwards or some one of the rest of the categories and each of these constitutes a certain limit but the infinite is not the same in magnitude and motion and duration as if it were a certain single nature but that which is subsequent is denominated according to that which is antecedent as for instance motion is denominated according to or conformably with the magnitude in regard of which the motion or the alteration or the increase is brought about time however is reckoned or computed in consideration of motion chapter eleven now that which undergoes a change is changed partly indeed according to accident as when we say the musician walks and partly when a thing is said simply to be changed in respect of something belonging to this undergoing a change for example whatsoever things are changed are changed according to parts for the body is reduced to a sound state of health because the eye is restored to a healthy condition now there is something which primarily is moved in itself or essentially and this is that which may have motion impressed upon it from itself and there is also something of the same sort in the case of that which imparts motion likewise for one thing imparts motion according to accident and another according to a portion but a third essentially or of itself and there is something that is the primary source of motion and there is something that has motion impressed upon it further is there the time in which and there is the place from which and the direction towards which a thing is moved but the forms and passive states and place into which are moved the things that are being moved themselves are immovable as science and heat but the heat does not constitute motion yet the process of heating does the change however that does not ensue according to accident does not reside in all things but in contraries and media and in contradiction but a reliance upon this statement may be drawn from induction now that which undergoes a change is changed either from a subject into a subject or from that which is not a subject into a subject or from a subject into a non-subject or from a non-subject into a subject but i mean by a subject that which is made manifest by affirmation wherefore changes must needs be three in number for that which is from a non-subject into a non-subject is not properly a change for it subsists neither between contraries nor between contradiction because there is not opposition in the case of a transition from a non-subject into a non-subject the change indeed therefore from that which is a non-subject into a subject according to contradiction amounts to generation and such a change of course when simply considered is simple generation and when it is partial it is partial generation but the change from subject into that which is non-subject amounts to corruption which when it is simply so is simple corruption but when it is partial it is partial corruption if therefore non-entity is predicated multifariously and that according to composition or division does not admit of being put in motion so neither can it be so with that according to capacity which is opposed to that which subsists simply for a thing that is not white or not good nevertheless admits of being moved according to accident for that which is not white may be a man but this cannot by any means be the case with this particular thing which subsists simply for it is impossible that non-entity should be moved 
and if this be admitted it is impossible also that generation amounts to motion for non-entity would be produced if it did for in such a case most especially would it be produced according to accident yet nevertheless it is true to assert of that which is generated simply that a non-entity has a subsistence in like manner also stands the case with the being in a state of rest and doubtless such are the difficulties that attend on this hypothesis even on the supposition that everything that is being moved is in place but what is a non-entity is not in place for it would be somewhere hence neither does corruption constitute motion for motion or rest is a thing that is contrary to motion but corruption is contrary to generation since however every motion amounts to a certain change and there are three changes as just now enumerated and of these the changes that ensue according to generation and corruption are not motions and these are those that subsist according to contradiction it is necessary that the change from subject into subject should alone constitute motion subjects however are either contraries or media and let privation be considered as a thing that is contrary and it is made manifest by affirmation for instance that which is naked and toothless and that which is black chapter twelve if therefore the categories are divided by substance quality place action or passion relation quantity there must needs subsist three motions of quality quantity and of place but according to substance there does not subsist any motion on account of there being nothing contrary to substance nor is there a motion of relation for it is possible when either of the relatives has not undergone a change that a verification should take place in regard of the other as having undergone no change wherefore the motion of these will subsist according to accident neither is there a motion of that which is active and passive or of that which is the efficient cause of motion and has motion impressed upon it because there is not a motion of motion nor a generation of generation nor in general a change of a change for in two ways is it possible that there be a motion of a motion first either as of a subject for instance as man is moved because from white he is changed into black wherefore thus also is it with motion either a thing is made warm or cold or undergoes alteration in place or increase this however is impossible for the change does not amount to any of the subjects or secondly there may subsist a motion of motion in respect of some different subject from change being altered into a different form as man is changed from sickness into health neither however is this possible except according to accident for every motion constitutes a change from one thing into another and in like manner the case stands with generation and corruption except that those changes i admit that are wrought from things that are posed in this or that way are not motions at the same time then is man changed from health into disease and from this very change into a different one it is therefore evident that when a man shall have become indisposed he shall undergo a change into a disease of some sort or other for it is admissible for such to remain in a state of rest and further it is evident that he will not be changed into that state which is invariably casual and that will amount to a change from something into something else so that health will be an opposite motion but from accident as for instance one undergoes an alteration from memory into oblivion because 
that wherein oblivion is inherent undergoes a change sometimes into scientific knowledge and sometimes into health further will the progression advance on to infinity if there will subsist a change of a change and a generation of a generation therefore also must there be the former on the supposition that there is the latter for instance if the simple act of generation take place at any time that also which is being generated simply has been produced wherefore not as yet in existence would be that which is being produced simply but something does exist that is being generated or produced or which already has been generated if therefore also this thing once was generated for what reason was that not yet in existence which is being then generated since however as regards things that are infinite there does not subsist anything that is primary there will not be that which is first generated and for this cause neither that which is in order consequential therefore that any of these either should be generated or be moved or undergo any change is not possible further contrary motion and rest and generation and corruption will belong to the same subject wherefore a thing that is being generated when it may become that which is being generated is then undergoing a process of corruption for neither is it immediately corrupted as soon as it is generated nor subsequently to this for that must necessarily exist which is undergoing a process of corruption further it is the case that matter ought to subsist under that which is being generated and undergoing a change therefore what matter will there subsist in like manner as an alterable body or soul in this way also anything that subsists on being produced constitutes either motion or generation and further what is that into which the thing is moved for it is necessary that something amount to the motion of this particular thing from this particular thing into that and yet that it should not be motion at all how let me ask then is this to take place for the generation of discipline does not amount to discipline so neither is it true to say that there will subsist a generation of generation since however there is not in existence motion either of substance or of relation or of action and passion it remains that there should subsist motion according to quality and quantity and place for to each of these doth there belong contrariety now i mean by motion according to quality not that which is found in substance for difference also constitutes quality but that which is passive in accordance with which a thing is said to be passive or to be devoid of passion with regard however to that which is immovable and that which upon the whole it is impossible should have motion impressed upon it and that which with difficulty in a long portion of duration or slowly commences its motion and that which having been by nature no doubt adapted for having motion imparted to it yet does not possess the capacity or ability of being moved when it is naturally fitted for motion both as to the place where and the manner how this is what i term merely a condition of rest amongst those things that are immovable for rest is a thing that is contrary to motion wherefore it would amount to a privation of that which is receptive or capable of motion and things are said to be moved according to place at the same time as many as are to be found in one original locality and those things are said to be moved separately as many as are to be found in a different place and things are said to be in contact with each other the extremities of which subsist together and that is a medium into which that is fitted by nature first to proceed which is undergoing a change before it arrives at that into which it is ultimately changed 
I mean what is uninterruptedly undergoing a change according to the constitution of nature. A thing is contrary in regard of place, which in a straight line is at the greatest distance possible, and a thing is successive between which, when it is after its first principle, either in position or form, or some other definite mode of subsistence, and that to which it is consequent, there subsists no intervening medium of things in the same genus. For instance, lines are successive to a line, or monads are successive to a monad, or a house to a house. There is no hindrance, however, to their subsisting any other medium between them, for that which is successive belongs to something in succession, and is something that is subsequent, for one is not successive to two, nor are the calends to the knowns, and a thing is coherent which, being successive, is in contact. Since, however, every change takes place in those things that are opposed, and these are contraries and contradiction, and since of contradiction there is nothing that is a medium, it is evident that in contraries there subsists a medium, and that which is continuous is that which has something of the nature of the coherent, or of that which is in a state of contact, and a thing is called continuous when the extremity of either of the parts by which they are in contact and in continuity may be one and the same. Wherefore, it is evident that what is continuous is to be found amongst those things from which, as compounds, there subsists any one thing naturally adapted for being generated according to contact. And that what is successive ranks as what is primary is evident likewise. For everything that is successive does not subsist in a state of contact, but this is the case with what is successive on the supposition that what is continuous subsists in a state of contact. Even, however, though they should subsist in a state of contact, they yet by no means amount to that which is continuous. Those things, however, in which there is not found contact, there does not subsist natural coherence in. Wherefore, a point is not the same thing with a monad, for, indeed, in points may be found contact, but this is not the case with monads, but these are successive to each other, and between points there may be found a certain medium, whereas we cannot discover any such between monads. End of chapter 12 and end of book 10 Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards Chapter 1 of Book 11 of Metaphysics by Aristotle Translated by John McMahon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards Chapter 1 The present speculation is concerned about substance, for the first principles and causes of substances are under investigation, for both if the universe be as one whole, substance constitutes the earliest portion, and if things subsist in a consequent order, in this way likewise would substance be first, and next quality, then quantity. But at the same time neither, so to say, are these simply considered entities, but qualities and motions in the same manner even as that which is not whole, and that which is not straight. Therefore we say that these also are in existence, for instance, that such a thing is not white. Further still, no one of the others possesses a separable subsistence. And to the truth of this statement bear witness also, in reality, the philosophers of antiquity, for they from time to time have investigated into the first principles and elements and causes of substance those to be sure that our philosophers nowadays have in preference sought to establish universals as substances for the genera are universals which they say are first principles and substances 
rather on account of their examining them logically. The philosophers, however, of old, regarded singulars as substances, for example, fire and earth, but not a common body. Now, substances are three in number. One, indeed, is cognizant by sense, the existence of which all acknowledge, and one part of this is eternal, and the other subject to decay, as plants and animals. But of the eternal portion of it, it is necessary that we should admit as elements either one or many. But another substance is immovable, and this, some say, involves a separable subsistence, amongst whom some make a division of it into two. Others, however, rank into one nature forms and mathematical entities, whereas others of these admit mathematical entities only as subsisting. The substances that are cognizant by sense belong then, of course, to the department of physical science, for they involve a connection with motion, but the immovable substance belongs to a different science, on the supposition that this possesses no first principle in common with the others. Chapter 2 Substance, cognizant by the senses, however, is susceptible of change. Now, on the supposition that change takes place from things that are opposed, or such as are media, and not from all things that are opposites, for the voice is not a thing that is white, but from that which is contrary, it is necessary that something also subsist capable of undergoing an alteration into contrariety, for contraries do not undergo a change. Further, does this no doubt continue permanent? That which is contrary, however, does not continue permanent. And hence doth there subsist a something third beside contraries, namely matter. If, therefore, changes are four in number, either according to quiddity, or according to quality, or quantity, or the place where, and if simple generation indeed, and corruption be what subsist according to quiddity, and increase and diminution be what subsist according to quantity, and alteration be that according to passion, and motion be that according to place, allowing all this to be the case, the several changes would take place into contrarieties, I mean, such as are involved in singulars. Therefore, it is necessary that matter should undergo a change which can pass into both. Since entity, however, is twofold, everything which undergoes a change is changed from that which is an entity in capacity into that which is an entity in energy, as, for example, from what is white in capacity or potentiality into that which is white in energy. And, in like manner also, does the case stand with increase and diminution. Wherefore, not only according to accident is it possible that all things be generated from non-entity, but, likewise, from entity do all things derive their generation. I speak of what is an entity in capacity deriving its generation from a non-entity in energy or activity. And this is the unit of Anaxagoras, for it is better to maintain this than the tenet of certain speculators who are of opinion that all things subsist simultaneously. And it is tantamount to the philosophic dogma of mixture adopted by Empedocles and Anaximander, and resembles the theory of Democritus, viz., that all things subsisted in capacity simultaneously and not in energy. Wherefore, in this case, they would touch upon matter, that is, the material cause. All things, however, involve matter as many as undergo a change. But entities involve different matter from one another. And of the things that are eternal, as many as are not generable, but movable, by an orbital motion, possess matter. Yet such matter as is not generable, but is merely moved from this place towards that. Now, one might raise the question, from what sort of non-entity generation could arise? 
for non-entity subsists in a threefold way. If, therefore, there subsists aught in capacity, from this will generation subsist. Yet, nevertheless, not from anything whatsoever, without distinction, but one thing will be generated from another. Neither is it sufficient to say that all things subsist simultaneously. For entities differ in matter, since why would things infinite in number be generated, but not one thing? For the faculty of the human understanding is one. Wherefore, if likewise matter be one, that would have been generated also in energy, the matter even of which would subsist in capacity. Therefore, are there three causes, and three first principles, two indeed amounting to contrariety, of which one sort constitutes the formal principle and the species, and the second privation, but the third cause is matter. Chapter 3 After these inquiries, there remains for us to make our readers aware that neither matter nor form is generated. Now, I speak thus of the extremities of things, for everything that undergoes any change is changed both by something and into something. By something, of course, I mean that which is the first imparter of motion, and of something, that is, matter, and that into which the thing is changed, this is the form. Therefore, they go on in a progression to infinity, if not only the brass becomes spherical, but also the spherical, or the brass is generated. Therefore, must we sooner or later come to a standstill in the series? After these inquiries, we must show how that each substance is generated from one synonymous with itself. For those things that are being generated by nature, as well as other things, are substances. For things are produced either by art, or nature, or chance, or spontaneity. Art, indeed, therefore, constitutes a first principle, which subsists in another subject, whereas nature constitutes a first principle, which subsists in the thing itself. For man begets man, and the remaining causes are the privations of these. Substances, likewise, are three in number, and one of these is matter, which is this certain particular thing in consequence of its appearance as such. For as many things as are one by contact, and not by cohesion, constitute matter, and a subject, but another of these substances is nature, which likewise is this certain particular thing, and into nature is there the transition of a certain habit. Further, the third substance is that which subsists from these, and is ranked as a singular, for example, Socrates, or Callias. As regards some things, therefore, this certain particular thing involves no subsistence independent of a composite substance, as the form of a house, unless art constitutes this form. Neither is there any generation and corruption of these, but after a different manner they are, and are not, both the house itself, which is unconnected with matter, and health, and everything that is produced according to art. But if forms subsist, they subsist in the case of those things that are generated by nature. Wherefore, doubtless, not injudiciously affirmed Plato, that forms belong to those things as many as involve a natural subsistence, on the supposition of the existence of forms different from, or independent of, these, as, for example, fire, flesh, the head, and so forth. For all these things are matter, and belong to substance especially, I mean, such a description of matter as is ultimate. Some causes, therefore, that are those that impart motion, subsist as entities that have been previously generated, whereas other causes, which subsist as the formal principle, are simultaneously generated with their results. For, when a man is in sound health, then also is there present with him sound health. And the form of the brazen sphere subsists simultaneously with the brazen sphere. And whether also there remains anything subsequently to the separation of form from the subject of form, we must examine. 
for in the case of some forms there is no hindrance to this taking place as if soul were a thing of this description not to be sure every soul but the understanding for that this should be so with every soul is not perhaps a thing that is possible it is evident therefore that there is no necessity that on account of these at least ideas should have an existence for man begets man the singular begets a certain individual and in like manner does the case stand with the arts for the medicinal art is the formal principle of health chapter four and as regards causes and first principles in a manner are they different according as they belong to different things and in a manner this is not the case supposing one to express himself universally and according to analogy the causes and first principles of all things will be the same for one might raise the question as to whether the first principles and elements of substances and of things which subsist as relatives are different or the same and therefore in like manner is it the case with each of the categories but it would be absurd if there were the same principles and elements of all things for from the same things will relatives derive their subsistence as well as substance what therefore will this be for besides substance and the rest of the things that are predicated there is nothing that is in common prior however is the element to those things of which it is an element but assuredly neither is substance an element of relatives nor is any of these an element of substance further how is it admissible that there should be the same elements of all things for none of the elements can be the same with that which is a composite nature of the elements as for instance neither b nor a can be the same with b a neither therefore is it possible that any one element of those natures that are intelligible as for example unity or entity can be the element of all things for these are present with each of the compound natures likewise no one of them therefore will have a subsistence either as substance or relation but it will be a thing expedient however that they should subsist in some form or other the elements then of all things are not the same or shall we say just as we have already affirmed that in one way this is the case and in another that it is not as perhaps in regard of sensible bodies that which is hot subsists in one way as form and after another mode that which is cold subsists as the privation thereof but matter subsists as that which primarily and essentially constitutes both of these in capacity substances however are both these and such as consist of those things of which there are the first principles or if any one thing is generated from what is hot and from what is cold as flesh or bone still that which is produced from thence must needs be different from these the first principles and elements of these i admit then are the same yet there are different elements of different things and without doubt we cannot say that the case stands in this way with all things but analogically are the elements and first principles of all things the same just as if one should say that there are three first principles in existence namely form and privation and matter each of these however is different according as it is conversant about every genus as in colour white black surface light darkness air and from these emerge forth day and night since however not only things that are inherent are causes but also causes of things that are external as for example in the case of what imparts motion it is evident that a first principle is a different thing from an element yet both are causes and into these is a first principle divided but what subsists as that which imparts motion or rest constitutes a certain first principle and substance 
Wherefore, there are in existence three elements indeed, according to analogy, but four causes and first principles, and a different cause subsists where the subject is different, and the first cause constitutes, as it were, that which imparts motion, and is different according as the subject is different. Thus, health is as form, disease as privation, body as matter. That which imparts motion is the medicinal art. Again, a house is as form, this certain sort of confusion as privation, the bricks are as matter, and that which imparts motion, or the efficient cause, is the builder's art. And into these, therefore, is a first principle divided. But since that which imparts motion in physical or natural things is a man, and in things springing from the understanding form, or the contrary, in one respect would there be three causes, and in another four, for the medicinal art constitutes in a manner health, and the building art the form of the house, and man begets man. Further, beside these, as that which is the first of all things, is that which imparts motion, or is the efficient cause to all things. Chapter 5. And, since some things involve a separable subsistence, and some do not involve a separable subsistence, the former are substances, and on this account these are the causes of all things, because the passive states and motions of things do not involve a subsistence independent of substances. In the next place, perhaps, will these constitute soul and body, or understanding and appetite and body. Moreover, in another manner, analogically, are first principles the same. For example, take the instances of energy and capacity. These, however, are both different according as the subjects of them are different, and they subsist in different ways. For in certain bodies the same thing subsists sometimes in energy and sometimes in capacity, as wine or flesh or a man. But also do these fall under the category of the causes above enumerated, for form constitutes an energy, no doubt, if it be that which has a separable subsistence, and which is compounded from both, and this is the case with privation, for instance, darkness, or a creature that is sick, but matter subsists in capacity, for this is that which is endued with the capability of becoming both. But after another mode do those things differ in energy and capacity of which the matter is not the same, and of which the form is not the same, but different, as a cause of man are both the elements fire and earth as matter, and his proper form, and if there is anything else extrinsic, I mean such as his father, and beside these the sun, and the oblique circle, which constitute neither matter, nor form, nor privation, nor are of the same species, but are motive natures. And, further, it is expedient for us to perceive that, as regards causes, it is possible to enumerate some that are universal, and some that are not. Therefore, the original first principles of all things are that which subsists in energy as this first thing, and something else which subsists in potentiality. Those indeed, therefore, that are universals have not any subsistence, for the singular constitutes a first principle of singulars. For man, to be sure, is the principle of universal man, yet there is no universal man. But Peleus is the cause of Achilles, and your father of you, and this particular letter B, is the cause of this syllable, B, A, and in short, B, of, B, A, absolutely. In the next place, the forms of substances are first principles, but there are different causes and elements of different things, as has been declared. Thus, of the things that are not contained in the same genus, such as colors, sounds, substances, 
quantity the elements are not the same except analogically the causes likewise of those things that are contained in the same species are different but they are not different in species but because the matter of singulars is a thing that is different both your matter and form and that which imparts motion and the species differ in number from mine though according to the formal principle of the universal they are the same therefore as to the inquiry what are first principles or elements of substances and relations and qualities as to whether they are the same or different it is evident that if they are predicated multifariously there are the same principles and elements belonging to everything but if they are divided there are not the same but different first principles of everything unless that also in a certain respect there are the same principles of all things thus they are the same analogically i admit because there is matter form privation that which imparts motion and in that way the causes of substances are as the causes of all things because on the supposition of substances being destroyed all things are destroyed further that which is first subsists in actuality and in this way are these primaries different as many as are contraries seeing that they neither are predicated as genera nor denominated multifariously further likewise are there different kinds of matter that are styled causes what therefore the first principles of sensibles are and what sort they are and after what mode they are the same and after what mode they are different all this has been declared chapter six but since there have appeared three substances two indeed that are natural or physical and one which is immovable regarding this immovable substance we must endeavour to establish that it is necessary that it should constitute a certain eternal substance one which is immovable for the first of entities are substances and if we suppose all of them to be corruptible all things are corruptible it is impossible however that in such a case motion should be either generated or that it should be corrupted for it was always in existence nor is this possible with duration for it is not possible that there can be that which is prior and subsequent on the supposition that time or duration has no existence and motion then in this way is continuous as also duration for duration either is the same as motion or it is a certain passive condition of motion but there is not any motion that is continuous save that which is local or topical and to this belongs the motion that is circular but doubtless if there is anything that is fit for being moved or that is productive but not anything that energizes in this case motion has no existence for it is admissible that what involves capacity should not energize there would then be no advantage gained not even if we could make substances eternal as those do who constitute as such the forms or ideas unless there will be inherent some first principle capable of working a change therefore neither would this be competent for such nor would there be any other substance different from or independent of the forms for on the supposition that it will not energize there will be no motion in existence further neither will this be the case if the substance will energize but if the substance thereof constitutes capacity for there will not be in existence a perpetual motion for it is possible that that which subsists in capacity should not exist it is therefore necessary that there should be a first principle of this kind whereof the substance constitutes an energy further therefore it is necessary that these substances do not involve a connection with matter 
for it is requisite that they should be eternal if in sooth there is also at least anything else that is everlasting it is then in energy that they subsist although this involves a matter of doubt for it appears to be the case that what energizes should subsist entirely in a state of potentiality but that everything that is endued with capacity should not altogether energize wherefore we may assume that potentiality is a thing that is antecedent to energy but surely if this be the case no one of the entities will be in existence for it is possible that a thing possess a capacity of existence but that yet it should not be in existence if the case however stands as the theologians affirm i mean those who are for generating all things from night or as the natural philosophers who say that all things subsisted simultaneously the same impossibility will ensue for how let me ask will matter be put in motion if nothing that subsists in energy will be a cause for the matter of a house at least will not itself move itself but the builder's art will nor does the menstrual blood move itself nor earth but seeds and human seed wherefore some have recourse to an energy that is always in action as leucippus and plato for they maintain that motion is always in existence but why and in what way they do not state nor how this is the case nor do they assign the cause of this perpetuity of motion for nothing is put in motion at random but it is necessary that there be something always in subsistence as now indeed one thing is by nature moved in this way and again is moved by force either by mind or something else after a different manner then what sort is the first motion for this inevitably differs as much as possible but certainly neither is it possible for plato at least to call that a first principle which imparts motion to itself and which he sometimes considers to be a first principle for subsequent to and yet coincident with the heaven is the soul as he says therefore the supposition of the priority of potentiality to energy is in a manner a correct one but in a manner is not so and how this is correct has been declared but that energy may be a thing that is antecedent to potentiality anaxagoras testifies for the understanding subsists in energy and empedocles in his theory about harmony and discord and this is confirmed in the assertion of certain philosophers as to the existence of perpetual motion as leucippus wherefore not in an infinite time did chaos or night subsist but the same things continually were in existence as are in existence at present either in a revolutionary system or otherwise on the supposition that energy is a thing that is antecedent to potentiality supposing a thing therefore to be the same continually in a revolutionary system it is necessary that something always should remain energizing in like manner but if there is likely to ensue generation and corruption it is necessary that there be something else which continually energizes at one time in one way and at another in another it is necessary then that it energizes in this way no doubt essentially or from itself but in a different way according to something else it must in this case energize either according to something that is different or according to what is primary or original it is therefore necessary that it energize according to this for again is that a cause of energy both to this and to that other wherefore that which is primary is superior as a cause for that likewise was a cause of a thing subsisting continually after a similar manner and something else would be the cause of the subsistence of energy in a different manner 
but of its subsistence always in a different manner manifestly would both be a cause therefore are motions also in this manner disposed why therefore must we go in search of other first principles end of chapter six of book eleven recording in memory of mitchell edwards chapter seven of book eleven of metaphysics by aristotle translated by john mcmahon this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards chapter seven but since also the case stands thus and if it be not so things will spring from night and from all things simultaneously and from non-entity these aforesaid questions may be decided and something always would there be that is being moved with a motion that is incessant but this is that which is circular and this is evident not merely from reason but from the fact itself wherefore the first heaven would be eternal there is therefore also something that imparts motion since however that which has motion impressed upon it and which imparts motion subsists as a medium there is therefore something which not having motion impressed upon it yet imparts motion which is a thing that is eternal being both substance and energy but in this way it imparts motion i mean that which is desirable and that which is intelligible impart motion whereas they are not moved themselves but the originals of these are the same for a thing that is the object of a propension is that which appears fair but a thing which is originally selected from volition actually is fair now we desire a thing because it appears fair rather than that a thing appears fair because we desire it for the perception constitutes a first principle but mind is moved by that which is intelligible and the other co-ordination constitutes essentially that which is intelligible and belonging to this is the first substance and of this is that substance which subsists absolutely and according to energy unity however is not the same with what is simple or absolute for unity signifies measure but what is absolute signifies the mode in which a thing itself subsists but certainly both that which is fair and that which is desirable for its own sake belong to the same coordinate series and that which is first is the most excellent invariably or amounts to that which is analogous to it but that the final cause subsists in things that are immovable the division makes manifest for the final cause of anything resides in those things of which the one is in existence and the other is not now that which first imparts motion does so as a thing that is loved and that which has motion impressed upon it imparts motion to other things if indeed therefore anything is being moved it is admissible also that it should subsist in a different manner wherefore if the primary motion constitute energy also so far forth as the thing is moved in this way is it likewise possible that it should subsist after a different mode in place though not in substance since however there is something that imparts motion itself being immovable and subsisting in energy this does not by any means admit of subsisting in a different manner for the primary motion belongs to the changes and of this that which is circular but this first mover imparts motion to that of necessity in this case must this immovable first mover constitute an entity and so far forth as it subsists necessarily so far forth does it subsist after an excellent manner and in this way constitutes a first principle 
For what is necessary subsists in thus many ways, in the first place by what is accomplished by violence, because it is contrary to free will, and secondly as that without which a thing does not subsist in an excellent manner, and thirdly as that which could not be otherwise from what it is, but involves an absolute subsistence. From a first principle, then, of this kind, I mean, one that is involved in the assumption of a first mover, hath depended the heaven and nature. Now, the course of life of this first mover, in like manner with our own, for a limited period of time, is such also, as is the most excellent. For, in the present instance, doth that first mover continue in the enjoyment of the principle of life for ever. For with us certainly such a thing as this would be impossible, but not so with the first mover, since even doth the energy or activity of this first mover give rise unto pleasure or satisfaction on the part of such, and on this account vigilance, exercise of the senses, and perception in general are what is most productive of pleasure or satisfaction, and with hopes and recollections is the case the same for these reasons now essential perception is the perception of that which is essentially the most excellent and that which is most essential perception is the perception of that which is most essential the mind however is cognizant of itself by participation in that which falls within the province of the mind as its object for it becomes an object of perception by contact and by an act of intellectual apprehension so that the mind and that which is an object of perception for the mind are the same for that which is receptive of impressions from what is an object of perception and is substance constitutes mind and when in possession of these impressions it energizes or subsists in a condition of activity wherefore that seems to belong to the first mover rather than to the mind of man and it is a divine prerogative which the mind appears to possess and contemplation constitutes what is most agreeable and excellent if therefore god in this way possesses such an excellent mode of subsistence for ever as we do for a limited period of duration the divine nature is admirable and if he possesses it in a more eminent degree still more admirable will be the divine nature in this way however is the deity disposed as to existence and the principle of life is at any rate inherent in the deity for the energy or active exercise of mind constitutes life, and God, as above delineated, constitutes this energy, and essential energy belongs to God as his best and everlasting life. Now, our statement is this, that the deity is an animal that is everlasting and most excellent in nature, so that with the deity life and duration are uninterrupted and eternal for this constitutes the very essence of god as many philosophers however as adopt the supposition such as the pythagoreans and speusippus that what is best and most fair is not to be found in the principle of things from the fact that though the first principles both of plants and animals are causes yet that what is fair and perfect resides in created things as results from these persons i say who entertain these sentiments do not form their opinions correctly for seed arises from other natures that are antecedent and perfect and seed is not the first thing whereas that which is perfect is as for example just as if one were to say that a man is antecedent to seed not the man that is being generated from seed, but another from whom the seed flows. That, indeed, there exists a certain eternal substance, and a substance that is immovable, and possesses actually a subsistence separable from sensibles, is evident from the statements that have been made above. 
but it also has been demonstrated that it is not possible for this substance to involve any magnitude, but it is devoid of parts and indivisible, for it imparts motion throughout infinite duration, and nothing that is finite involves infinite potentiality. Since, however, every magnitude is either infinite or finite, for this reason such a substance as the above would not involve a finite magnitude, and therefore it cannot involve an infinite magnitude, because, in short, there is no infinite magnitude in existence. But, unquestionably also, it has been demonstrated that such is impassive and unalterable, for all other motions are subsequent to that motion which is local or topical. These statements, therefore, make it evident why it is that the deity is disposed as to existence after this manner. Chapter 8 Now, whether are we to admit that there exists one substance of this description, or many? And, if so, how many such there are ought not to escape our notice? But we should call to remembrance also the assertions of other philosophers, because, regarding the multitude of these substances, they have not spoken aught which amounts to even anything that is clear in the expression. For, indeed, the opinion in regard of ideas does not involve any peculiar investigation, for the persons who affirm the existence of ideas affirm that these ideas are numbers, and, as regards numbers, at one time they speak of them as of things that are infinite, and at other times as of things that are limited, as far as to the decade. As to the cause, however, why it is that there subsists a multitude of numbers of this kind, nothing is expressed by them with demonstrative certainty. This, however, must we declare from principles that are taken for granted, and that have been determined. For the first principle, and the original existence of entities, is a thing that is immovable, both essentially and according to accident, and it imparts motion with an original and eternal and single motion. But, since that which is being moved must needs derive its motion from something, and that which first imparts motion is essentially immovable, and an eternal motion derives that motion from what is eternal as a moving cause, and a single motion its motion from what is single, and, since we see that beside the simple revolutionary motion of the universe, which we say derives its motion from the first substance, and that which is immovable, there are other motions that are everlasting, namely, those of the planets, for eternal and unstable in its movement is a body that is circular, but we have furnished demonstrations in regard of these in our physics. Now, I say, since the foregoing is the case, each of these motions must needs derive its motion from that which is both immovable essentially and is an eternal substance. For the nature of the stars consists in being a certain eternal substance, and that which imparts motion is eternal, and is antecedent to that which has motion impressed upon it and that which involves priority of subsistence to a substance must needs also be a substance. It is evident, therefore, that it is expedient that there should be in existence substances of this kind, such as are both naturally eternal, as well as essentially immovable and devoid of magnitude, and that, too, on account of the cause that has been stated previously that indeed, therefore, these substances are in existence, and which of these is primary, and which of them is secondary, according to the same order, with the orbital motions of the stars, is evident. But at present must we discover the multitude of these orbital motions from that department of the philosophy of the mathematical sciences, which is most appropriately devoted to this purpose, I mean, from astronomy. For, this science institutes an investigation respecting a substance that is cognizant by sense, no doubt, but such as is eternal. The rest of the mathematical sciences, however, are not concerned about any substance whatever. For example, take the case of the science respecting numbers and geometry. 
that therefore there are numerous orbital motions belonging to the stars that are being moved across the arch of heaven is evident to those who have even moderately busied themselves in such inquiries for more motions than one do each of the planetary stars assume but as to how many these happen to be let us likewise now declare the statements which some of the mathematicians make on this subject for the purpose of understanding the point under investigation in order that it may be possible to apprehend a certain multitude of these when mentally defined but as to what remains we must ourselves investigate into some points but we must make inquiries into others from persons engaged in investigations into these subjects if haply anything beside the statements that already have been made may appear to those who are busied in these speculations and if so we should bestow affection upon both yet yield our assent only to those who are more accurate eudoxus in his system therefore laid down the orbital motion of the sun and moon to be severally in three spheres the first of which he maintained was that of the fixed stars and the second was that which accords with the circle which passes through the central signs of the zodiac and the third with that circle which is situated obliquely in the latitude of the zodiacal signs now that oblique circle through which the moon is carried is situated in a wider latitude than that through which the sun is carried but of the devious or erratic stars he makes a disposition of each in four spheres and of these likewise he considers the first and second to be the same with those of the sun and moon for the sphere of the fixed stars according to him is the same with that first sphere which carries along all the orbs and that which has been arranged under this and possesses a motion corresponding with the circle that passes through the central signs of the zodiac he considers a sphere common to all these heavenly bodies he is of opinion however that the poles of the third sphere which is common to all are situated in that circle which passes through the central signs of the zodiac and that the motion of the fourth sphere is in an orbit declining towards the centre of the third and that the poles of the third sphere are the proper poles of the other spheres but that venus and mercury have the same poles callippus however sets down the same disposition of the spheres with eudoxus that is the same arrangement of their mutual distances but with respect to their multitude he ascribed to the star of jupiter as well as to that of saturn the same number with eudoxus yet still he thinks that to the luminary of the sun and to that of the moon there should further be annexed two spheres that is supposing one likely to furnish a solution of the phenomena and in regard of the other spheres of the planets he adds one sphere to each it is necessary however on the supposition that all when collected together are likely to furnish a solution of the phenomena that according to each of the erratic stars there should be different spheres revolving less by one than those which carry along the planets and in regard of position restore into the same place the first sphere invariably of the star which is ranked in an inferior order for in this way only is it possible that by the orbital motion of the planets should be produced all the phenomena that may be observed since therefore as regards the spheres in which the planets are carried along some of them are made to amount to eight but others to five and twenty and of these it is not necessary that those merely should have revolving spheres in which a star arranged lowest down is carried those accordingly that impart a revolutionary motion to the spheres of the two first will be six in number while those to the spheres of the four subsequent stars will be eleven the total amount of all the spheres however as well those that carry along the stars as also those that make them revolve will be fifty and five but if one were not to add the motions of the moon which we have mentioned to the sun also all the spheres will be forty and seven 
let the number then of the spheres amount to so many wherefore it is reasonable to suppose that both the substances and the first principles which are immovable and are cognizant by the senses should be so many in number as we have enumerated for that there must necessarily be such a number as this let it be left to those to decide who are endued with greater ability to declare their sentiments on such points if however it is not possible that there should be any orbital motion which does not contribute towards the orbital motion of a star and further if it is requisite to suppose that every nature and every substance ought to be regarded provided it be devoid of passion and be essential as having attained the most excellent end in this case there would not be in existence any other nature independent of these but it is necessary that this should constitute the total amount of substances for whether there should be others they would impart motion as being an end of orbital motion but at any rate it is impossible that there should be other orbital motions beside those that have been enumerated and this supposition it would be reasonable to arrive at from observing the bodies that are being moved along the surface of the heavens for on the supposition that everything that is born along the firmament subsists by the constitution of nature on account of that body which is born along and that every motion belongs to something that is carried forward there would not exist any orbital motion on account of itself or of another motion but on account of the stars would it exist for if we admit that orbital motion will subsist on account of motion of the same sort it will be requisite that this latter likewise should subsist on account of other orbital motions so that since it is not also possible to go on in a progression to infinity an end of every orbital motion will be some one of those divine bodies that are borne along the surface of the heaven that however there is one heaven is evident for if there were many heavens as there are men in regard of each will there be such a first principle as is one in species but in number many at least such things however as are many in number involve a connection with matter for there is one and the same mode of reasoning applicable to the case of many take the instance of a man yet socrates is one but that which ranks as first amongst formal causes does not involve a connection with matter for it subsists in actuality accordingly in both reason and number that which primarily imparts motion is immovable and that which has motion impressed upon it in this case is always and uninterruptedly one thing merely such being true there is consequently in existence one solitary heaven traditions however have been handed down from our predecessors and the very ancient philosophers and left to their posterity in the form of a myth to the effect that these many heavens supposing them to exist both are gods and that the divinity encompasses the entire of nature and the remainder of these traditions in the present day have been brought forward clothed in a fabulous garb for the purpose of winning the assent of the multitude and enforcing the utility that is urged in favor of the laws and of general expediency for they speak of these as subsisting in the form of the human species and as being like in appearance to certain of the rest of the animal kingdom and other statements consequential upon these and similar to those that have been declared do they put forward now if as regards these traditions any one having separated this from amongst the others may receive merely the first assertion namely that they supposed the first substances to be gods he would consider that this statement had been made after a divine manner and in accordance with what is to be expected in the discovery as frequently as is consistent with possibility as well of every art as of every system of philosophy and in the loss of these again he must conclude that likewise these opinions of those very ancient philosophers as relics have been preserved up to the time of the present day this opinion therefore of our forefathers and that which has been traditionally handed down from the very earliest speculators is evident to us thus far 
and no more. Chapter 9 There are points, however, respecting mind, which involve certain subjects of doubt, for it seems certainly to constitute the most divine existence amongst phenomena, but after what manner it is disposed, so as that it should be a thing of this sort, is attended with certain difficulties, for whether it be void of the faculty of understanding anything, but is like one who is sleeping, what, may I ask, would there be reverential in such a condition of being? Or, supposing that it possesses the faculty of understanding, and yet that there be something which is dominant over this faculty, for in this case that which is its substance is not intelligence, but capacity, should the foregoing be true, we could not say that mind would be the most excellent substance, for it is through the faculty of the understanding that that which is entitled to reverence is inherent in the mind. But, further, whether understanding constitute its substance, or whether perception does, what, may I ask, does it understand? For either it is itself that it understands, or something else, and, supposing that it understands something else, either it will invariably be the same, or something different. Whether, then, is there any difference, or no difference at all, between its understanding what is fair, and understanding what is casual? Or, also, would it be an absurd idea to imagine that it exercises the faculty of cognition in regard of certain things? It is evident, therefore, that that which understands is most divine, and most entitled to reverence, and that it undergoes no change. For change would presuppose a transition into something that is worse, and a thing of this sort would, in the present instance, amount to a certain motion. In the first place, then, of course, supposing that the mind were not perception or intelligence, but capacity, it is reasonable to infer that continuity of perception would be a laborious operation for the mind, and in the next place it is evident that there would be in existence something else that is more entitled to reverence than mind, namely, that which is an object of perception to the mind. For both the faculty of understanding and actual perception will be present to the mind, even in its understanding that which is most inferior, so that we must avoid this consequence, for also would it be better not to see some things than to see them. Hence, perception would not constitute that which is most excellent. Accordingly, may we assume that mind is cognizant of its own operations, if it really is that which is most superior, and if perception amounts to the perception of a perception. Now, scientific knowledge invariably appears as well as perception by sense and opinion, and the faculty of thought, to be conversant about something different from itself and to be conversant about itself only in a secondary or subordinate sense. Further, if we suppose that understanding is different from being an object of perception to the understanding, according to which of these will subsistence in an excellent way be inherent in mind? For neither is it the same thing the being inherent in an act of perception by the understanding, and in an object of perception to the understanding, or shall we say that in the case of some things the science constitutes itself that which is the object of the science? In the case, I admit, of the productive sciences, the substance and the essence do not involve a connection with matter, whereas in the case of the speculative sciences, the definition or formal principle is the object of the science, as well as is the perception exercised by the mind. Inasmuch, then, as the object of the understanding is not a different thing from the understanding itself, in the case of as many things as do not involve a connection with matter, they will be the same thing, and the act of perception by the mind will be identical with the object of perception. Moreover, therefore, a doubt remains whether an object of perception is a composite nature or not. For, if this be the case, the object of perception, as a compound, would undergo a change in the parts of the entire. Or, shall we say that everything is indivisible, which does not involve a connection with matter, as the human mind? 
or are we to take for granted that the perception of compound objects involves a connection with matter during a certain portion of duration for an excellent condition of subsistence does not always reside in this particular thing or in that but that which is most excellent subsists in a thing viewed as a certain entirety being something different from itself and therefore the first and actual perception by mind of mind itself doth subsist in this way throughout all eternity chapter ten but we must also consider in what manner the nature of the entire creation involves what is good and what is most excellent whether there exists something that has been separated in point of fact and which actually subsists essentially or whether we are to assume the existence of order or make both of these assumptions together just as we might illustrate our meaning by the case of an army for the good or excellent condition of an army depends upon the order that is enforced and the commander who aims to promote this subordination even this person in a more eminent degree may be regarded as a cause of such an excellent condition for this officer is not set over the army on account of the order that is found to prevail there but that order is found to exist on account of the command exercised by this officer all things however are coordinated after a certain mode but not after a similar mode take the classification for example of aquatic and winged animals and of plants and they are not disposed after such a way as that there should not subsist anything in common to either in relation to the other although in respect of some point do they involve some resemblance for indeed in regard of one characteristic are all things ranked under coordinate series but as in a house it is allowable least of all for the free to do anything whatsoever they please but all things or most things have been reduced into a state of orderly arrangement so to slaves likewise and wild beasts only in a small degree belongs a desire to do what may contribute to the general advantage but for the most part their operations are confined to whatsoever chances to fall in their way for the nature of each of them constitutes to them a first principle of this description but i say in this instance that it is requisite for all to attain unto a condition where distinctions will be drawn and other things subsist in this way of which all participate for the constitution or preservation of the entire but whatever impossibilities or absurdities ensue to those who make assertions in a different way and what sort of theories those put forward on the subject who express themselves in a more elegant or accomplished manner and in the case of which of these there prevail the least number of doubts we must not allow such inquiries to escape our observation for all philosophers are for producing all things from contraries neither however is the expression all things nor the expression from contraries close quote, correctly employed by these speculators nor do they declare as regards those things in which the contraries are inherent in what manner they will consist of contraries for contraries are mutually impassive but by us is this controversy decided rationally by the introduction of a certain third nature some however constitute some one of the contraries as matter just as those do who make the odd subject for the even or plurality for unity and this likewise is decided in the same manner for the matter which is one is not what is contrary to anything further all things except unity will participate in what is worthless for the evil itself constitutes one or other of the elements the other speculators assert however that neither what is good and what is evil are first principles at all notwithstanding that what is good is in a most eminent degree a first principle in all things and some i admit correctly make this assertion of what is good i mean that we must consider it a first principle after what mode however it is that what is good constitutes a first principle they do not state whether it is to be regarded as an end or as a moving cause or as a formal principle now empedocles also forms his opinions absurdly upon this point 
for he makes harmony to constitute what is good, and this harmony in his system subsists even as a first principle that imparts motion, for it has the power of congregating entities, and it subsists as matter, for it is a portion of the mixture. Now, even on the supposition that to harmony has it happened in this same system that it should subsist as matter, and a first principle, and as a power that imparts motion, yet the essence of this is not the same with the essence of these, according to which of them, therefore, will harmony subsist. And that discord should be a thing that is incorruptible would be absurd likewise, and yet this very thing constitutes the nature of what is evil. But Anaxagoras regarded what is good as a first principle, so far as it is a power that imparts motion, for mind in his system imparts motion. It imparts motion, however, for the sake of something else. Wherefore, that is different from that for the sake of which it subsists, except it subsists, as we say, it actually does. For the medicinal art, in a manner, constitutes health. But it was also an absurdity contained in the Anaxagorean philosophy, the not having produced a contrary to what is good as well as to mind. But all who assert contraries to be first principles do not employ contraries as such, unless one is disposed to handle the subject in a careless vein. And why is it that some things are corruptible and some things incorruptible? No one declares, for they produce all entities from the same first principles. Further, some of these speculators produce entities from what is non-entity, but some, that they may not be forced to this, make all things to be one. Further, no one lays down a reason why generation will always exist, and what the cause of generation is, nobody declares. And for those who create two first principles, will it be necessary to have a different first principle, which would be more dominant? as well as for those philosophers who introduce forms, because there really exists another principle more dominant than these. For why has matter participated, or why does it participate in these ideas? And for others it is necessary that there should be something that is contrary to wisdom, and to that which is the science most entitled to reverence. But to us this is not necessary, for there is nothing contrary to what is primary. For all the contraries involve matter, and these subsist in capacity. But contrary ignorance is opposed to what is contrary, yet nothing is contrary to what is primary. Further, on the supposition that there do not exist other things beside those that are cognizant by the senses, there will not subsist a first principle, and order, and generation, and the celestial bodies will have no existence. But there is always a first principle of the principle, just as we find in the systems of theologians and all natural philosophers. Now, admitting that there will be forms or numbers, they will not constitute a cause of anything. And if they are not a cause of anything, neither will they be a cause of motion at any rate. Further, how, let me ask, will magnitude and continuity arise from things that are devoid of magnitude? For, Number will not produce a continuous quantity, either as that which imparts motion or as form. But certainly there will not be anything, at least, belonging to the contraries, which is both productive and motive, for it would admit of non-existence. But surely the energy or producing cause is subsequent to the capacity, and in such a case eternal entities do not exist, but yet they do exist. Accordingly, some one of these hypotheses must be rejected, and this has been declared in the above statement that capacity antecedes energy, as to how it must be accomplished. Further, in what way numbers may be one, or soul and body, and in general, form, and the thing itself, no one says anything on this point, nor is it possible that one should declare his sentiments thereupon, unless he express himself as we do namely, to the effect that it is the cause which imparts motion that is the agent of production. But they who say that mathematical number is the first, 
and in this way continually suppose the existence of another substance adhering thereto in succession, and of different first principles belonging unto each, these make the substance of the universe to be adventitious. For in no wise does one substance contribute anything towards another, as to whether it exists or does not exist, and besides this they introduce many first principles. The entities, however, do not choose to submit to injudicious government. Quote, the government of many is not a good thing. Let there be one ruler. Close quote. End of chapter 10 and end of book 11. Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards. Chapter 1 of Book 12 of Metaphysics by Aristotle. Translated by John McMahon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Edwards. Chapter 1. Respecting indeed, therefore, the substance of things that are cognizant by the senses, it has been declared what it is in the mode of inquiry adopted by natural philosophers in their theories concerning matter, and subsequently in our own treaties in regard of matter in a condition of energy or activity. Since, however, our present investigation has, for its object, to ascertain whether besides sensible substances there is in existence a certain substance that is immovable and eternal, or there is not, and, on the supposition of the existence of any such, what it is, in the first place we must take a glance at the assertions made by other speculators, in order that, if they happen to make any assertion, not after a correct manner, we may not become entangled in the same errors, and that if there subsists any dogma in common between ourselves and them, we may not be indignant with it as a thing peculiarly in opposition to our present design. For it is a thing that we should remain content with, if one should make some statements with more propriety, but others in a way no wise inferior to ourselves. Now, there are two opinions respecting these subjects, for certain philosophers affirm that mathematical entities are substances, such, for example, as numbers and lines, and those things that are kindred to these, and, again, that ideas are existences of this description. Since, however, some speculators constitute these as two distinct genera, I mean, both the ideas and the mathematical numbers, and others maintain in opposition that there is one nature of both, and certain other philosophers say that mathematical entities are alone substances, in the first place we must institute an investigation respecting mathematical entities, without annexing to them any other nature as, for instance, might, or might not be the case, according to whether they happen to be ideas or not, and whether these are first principles and substances of entities or not. But, as regards mathematical entities, attending to this point merely, whether they possess a subsistence or do not, and, if they do, after what mode they subsist. In the next place, after these inquiries, we shall, apart by itself, institute an investigation concerning the ideas themselves, simply considered, and as much for the sake of usage as anything else. For most of the tenets of what relates to these inquiries have been divulged even by exoteric discourses respecting them. Further also, in regard of that particular form of investigation, it is necessary that we encounter a more enlarged philosophic discussion when we come to be engaged in our inquiries as to whether the substances and first principles of entities are numbers and ideas. For, after the investigation relating to ideas, this one remains as a third subject for inquiry but it is requisite, on the supposition of the existence of mathematical entities, that these should reside either in objects that fall under the notice of the senses, as certain affirm, or that they should involve a subsistence separable from sensibles. And some make a statement in this way, or if they are not inherent in either one or the other, they either have no existence at all, or exist in some different manner 
wherefore the question with us will not be concerning the existence of mathematical entities but concerning their mode of existence chapter two that indeed therefore it is impossible that these mathematical entities should reside in objects that are cognizant by the senses and that at the same time the reason assigned for this position is a fictitious one has been declared also in the doubts where we have proved that it is impossible that there should be two solids in the same place at the same time and further also it depends on the same course of reasoning both that other potentialities and natures should reside in sensibles and that no one of them should possess a separable subsistence these things then have been already declared but in addition to these statements it is evident that it is impossible that any body whatsoever should be divided for it will be divided according to a superficies and this according to a line and a line according to a point wherefore supposing that it is impossible to divide a point it is also impossible to divide a line and if it is impossible to divide a line the case is the same with the other mathematical quantities likewise what therefore is the difference in allowing either that natures of this description should exist or that these do not exist at all but that such natures should be found in sensibles for the same consequence will ensue for on the supposition of a division of the sensibles they also will be divided or they will not be of the nature of sensibles but the fact is neither is it possible that such natures should be actually at least separated for if independent of such as are cognizant by the senses there should exist other solids that are actually in a condition of separation therefrom and which are antecedent to those that are cognizant by sense it is evident that it is also necessary that besides surfaces there should exist other surfaces that involve a separable subsistence and in like manner other points and lines for this deduction rests upon the same reasoning and if these points be admitted again in addition to the surfaces and lines and points of a mathematical solid there will be different ones subsisting in a separate condition for incomposite natures are antecedent to those that are composite and if antecedent to sensibles there exist bodies which do not fall under the notice of the senses by the same reasoning those very surfaces which subsist essentially will likewise be antecedent to those surfaces that are to be found in immovable solids wherefore those surfaces and lines are different from those which at the same time are inherent in separated solids for the latter indeed are capable of consubsistence with mathematical solids but the former are antecedent to mathematical solids again therefore there will be lines belonging to these surfaces prior to which there will needs be different lines and points for the same reason and of those points contained in the lines that have an antecedent subsistence to those cognizant by sense there will be other prior points to which there will no longer belong different ones that have this prior subsistence wherefore also such an accumulation as the foregoing would be absurd for it happens that independent of such as fall under the notice of the senses there subsist single solids no doubt yet that there are three ranks of surfaces beside those that are cognizant by the senses and that one of these subsists beside those that are sensible and that the second resides in mathematical solids and that the third subsists beside those sensibles that are inherent in these and that there exists a fourfold classification of lines and that there are five ranks of points wherefore let me ask respecting which of these will the mathematical sciences be conversant for undoubtedly they are not conversant respecting the surfaces and lines and points that are resident in an immovable solid for a science is always conversant about subjects that involve a priority of subsistence and the same reasoning holds good respecting numbers also for beside each of the points will there exist other monads and beside each of the entities that fall under the notice of sense next in order will subsist those that are objects of perception for the mind wherefore there will exist infinite genera of mathematical numbers 
Further, how is it possible that we should decide the questions of controversy which we have taken a review of in the doubts enumerated above? For the objects about which astronomy is conversant will in like manner be different from those that are cognizant by sense, and this will be the case too with those particulars about which geometry is concerned. But let me ask the question how it is possible that heaven and the parts thereof subsist or any other thing whatsoever that involves motion, and the case stands the same in regard of those objects that pertain unto optics and harmonics, for there will exist both voice and a power of vision in addition to the things that fall beneath the notice of our senses, and to singulars. Wherefore, it is evident that there will be in existence both other senses and other objects of the senses. For why, may I ask, should these exist rather than those? If, however, these do exist, there will also be in existence other animals, if the truth be that also there are other senses. Further, are some things described by the mathematicians as universal in addition to these substances? therefore will this also constitute a certain other separated substance intermediate between both ideas and media and which will be neither number nor points nor magnitude nor duration but if this is impossible it is evident that it is impossible that those natures also should be separated from sensibles now the short of the matter is this that the very contrary takes place both to what is in fact true and habitually supposed to be true, if one will in this way seek to establish the existence of mathematical entities as certain natures possessed of a separated subsistence. For it is necessary, from the fact of the subsistence of these in this manner, that they should be antecedent to magnitudes that are cognizant by the senses, when yet, in reality, they are subsequent to them. For an imperfect magnitude is prior in generation, but subsequent in substance, in the same way as what is inanimate is prior to that which is animated. Further, in what way also at all will these mathematical magnitudes be one? And when will this be the case? For the things, of course, that are here reside in the soul, or a portion of the soul, or in something else that is endowed with reason. And if this be not the case, many things are exposed to dissolution. But now... What is the cause of those things which are divisible, and pertaining to quantity being one, and remaining in conjunction with one another as such? Further, do generations make this evident? For in the first place, no doubt, such make a transition into what pertains unto length, in the next place into what pertains unto breadth, and lastly into what relates to depth, and has reached an end. If, therefore, that which is subsequent in generation may be antecedent in substance, corporeity would be antecedent to a surface and a length, and will be both perfect and an entirety in this way, in preference, because it is rendered a thing that is animated. But how, one may ask, would a line or a surface become animated? For such an axiom as this would be above the grasp of our senses." Further, it is true, corporeity constitutes a certain substance, for already doth it in a manner involve that which is perfect, but how are lines said to be substances? For neither are they substances in the same manner as species, and a certain form. For example, if in such a case we should admit that soul were a thing of this sort, nor are they substances in the same way as matter, for instance, take the case of body as a thing of this description, for nothing appears as endued with a capacity of consisting either from lines or surfaces or points. But supposing that it were a certain material substance, this would appear as one that is endued with a capacity of assuming passive states. In definition, then, granting that mathematical natures will be antecedent to sense, yet it does not follow that all things whatsoever that are prior in definition should be prior also in substance. For those things that are prior in substance indeed are whatsoever things which, involving a separate subsistence, are transcendent in their essence. But all those things are prior in definition, of which there are definitions compounded of definitions. These, however, are not inherent at the same time. 
for if there are not in existence passive conditions independent of the substances to which they belong as for example a something that has motion imparted to it or which is white whiteness will be prior to a white man and will be prior in accordance with the definition but not in accordance with the substance for it does not admit of a separate subsistence but it always subsists in conjunction with a thing in its entirety now i mean by entirety a man for instance who is white wherefore it is evident that neither is that prior which subsists by abstraction nor is that subsequent which subsists by addition for by addition is a man styled white by reason of whiteness that indeed therefore neither are mathematical entities in a greater degree existences than bodies and that they are not antecedent in their essence to those objects that fall under the notice of the senses but are so merely in point of definition and that it is not possible that they should be made to involve a separate subsistence in any place has been declared with sufficient clearness since however neither in sensibles is it possible for these to subsist it is evident that either in short they have no existence at all or they subsist after some mode or other and on this account not simply do they exist for existence we predicate multifariously chapter three for in the same manner also as universals in mathematics are not conversant about things that have been separated and in this condition of separation subsist independent of magnitudes and numbers but are concerned about these but not so far forth as they are things of such a kind as to involve magnitude or to be divisible it is evident that there is a possibility of their likewise being in existence both definitions and demonstrations respecting those magnitudes which fall under the notice of our senses not however so far forth as they are things cognizable by sense but so far forth as they are universals for in like manner as also so far forth as things are in motion merely there are many formal principles of them independent of the essence of each of the things of this sort and of their accidents and since there is no necessity on account of these things either that there should exist anything that is being moved in a condition of actual separation from sensibles or that there should be in things that are such as these any separated nature at all so therefore likewise in the case of things that are being moved will there be rational principles and sciences not however so far forth as they are things that are in motion but so far forth as they are bodies merely and again so far forth as they are surfaces merely and so far forth as they are lengths merely and so far as they are divisible and so far as they are indivisible and things which involve position and so far forth as they are indivisible merely wherefore since it is absolutely true to affirm not only that things capable of a separate subsistence exist but also things that are not capable of this separable subsistence as for instance that things in motion exist so as regards mathematical entities it is absolutely true to affirm that such mathematical entities exist and that at any rate they are such as they are asserted to be and likewise as it is absolutely true to affirm in respect of the rest of the sciences that there are sciences conversant with this particular thing and not with that which is accidental to it for instance that there is one of what is white if that which is salubrious should be what is white but so far forth as it is salubrious yet they are not conversant with that i say which is salubrious but with that to which each science of it belongs if it is salubrious that is in this case with the salubrious and if so far forth as such is a man it is conversant with man so also that this is the case with geometry it does not however follow even though sensibles happen to belong to those objects about which geometry is conversant and though it may not be conversant with them so far forth as they are sensibles that the mathematical sciences will be concerned with objects that fall under the notice of the senses and they will not certainly be conversant with these while there are in existence other separate natures 
but many things are essentially accidental in things as far forth as each peculiar quality of such is inherent in each since both as far as an animal is female and so far forth as it is male these are its peculiar affections although there is not anything that is female or anything that is male which involves a subsistence separable from animals wherefore also the case is the same so far forth as there are lengths merely and so far as there are surfaces and by so much the more as geometry is employed about those things that are prior in definition and which are more simple by so much the more does it involve the consideration of what is accurate but the accurate is what is simple wherefore geometry speculates into things that are without magnitude rather than into those that are connected with magnitude and especially are without motion but if it contemplates motion especially will it contemplate that motion which is primary or original for this is most simple and of this is that motion which is equable and there is the same mode of reasoning both in the case of the sciences of harmonics and optics for neither are the speculations of either carried on as far forth as the power of vision or as far forth as voice is concerned but as far forth as lines and numbers are the objects of inquiry for these of course are the appropriate affections of those and this is the case with mechanical science in like manner wherefore if any one admitting the existence of those things which involve a separate subsistence from accidents makes any inquiry respecting these so far forth as they are such he will not for this reason utter any falsehood just as neither does he do so when he describes anything on the earth and says that that is the measure of a foot which is not the measure of a foot for not in the propositions doth the falsehood lurk but thus would each particular be investigated in the most excellent manner if any one having effected as he thought a separation should regard as such that which does not in reality possess a separate subsistence as is done by the arithmetician and geometrician for one indeed and indivisible is man so far forth as he is man but the arithmetician has established an indivisible one and next he considers whether there is anything that is an accident in man so far forth as he is indivisible the geometrician on the other hand carries on speculations relative to man neither as far forth as he is man nor as far forth as he is indivisible but as far forth as he is a solid for what things even though he were not indivisible anywhere would be inherent in him is evident because even without these that which is endued with capacity admits of being inherent in this very man wherefore on this account geometricians with correctness make assertions and discourse concerning entities and entities have an existence for twofold is entity the one subsisting in actuality and the other materially since however that which is good is different from that which is fair for the one is always in conjunction with the method of doing a thing but that which is fair also resides in things that are immovable those who assert that the mathematical sciences make no affirmation about what is fair or good make a false assertion for they do speak of these and frame demonstrations of them in the most eminent sense of the word for if they do not actually employ these names they do not exhibit even the results and the reasons of these and therefore they can hardly be said to make any assertion about them of what is fair however the most important species are order and symmetry and that which is definite which the mathematical sciences make manifest in a most eminent degree and since at least these appear to be the causes of many things now i mean for example order and that which is a definite thing it is evident that they would assert also the existence of a cause of this description and its subsistence after the same manner as that which is fair subsists in we will however declare our sentiments in regard of these points in a more intelligible form elsewhere chapter four 
respecting indeed therefore mathematical natures that they are entities and how far they are entities and how in one respect they are not antecedent to sense and how in another they are antecedent let thus much suffice to have been said on this subject concerning ideas however we must in the first instance examine into the actual opinion in regard of the idea which would not in any degree connect it with the nature of numbers but in accordance with the hypothesis that has prevailed from the earliest age amongst those who originally were the first to affirm the existence of ideas the opinion however in regard of forms happened to be adopted by those who make assertions in this way on account of their being persuaded respecting the reality of this dogma by the arguments adduced by heraclitus to show that all entities that fall under the notice of the senses are in a state of continual flux wherefore if there are systems of science and of practical wisdom conversant about anything we affirm that some different natures in a condition of permanence must necessarily exist beside those that are cognizant by the senses for it is plain that a science of those things that are in a state of flux has no existence now seeing that socrates was engaged in forming systems in regard of the ethical or moral virtues and was the first to institute an investigation in regard of the universal definition of these for to be sure democritus to a small extent merely busied himself in physical inquiries and defined after what mode that which is hot and that which is cold subsisted but the pythagoreans previously to his time brought forward definitions in respect of some few things the formal principles of which these philosophers connected with numbers as for example take the instance what opportunity constitutes or justice or marriage socrates notwithstanding i say from time to time investigated into quiddity or what a thing is and this too on rational grounds for his aim was to form syllogisms and we know that quiddity is a first principle of syllogisms for dialectical strength not as yet had at that time any existence so that they were able even without the possession of quiddity or the substance of a thing to institute inquiries into those things that are contraries even though we should suppose that there would be the same science of contraries for there are two improvements in science which one might justly ascribe to socrates now i allude to his employment of inductive arguments and his definition of the universal for both of these belong to a science that is conversant about a first principle socrates however did not it is true constitute universals as things involving a separable subsistence nor did he regard the definitions as such the other philosophers however invested them with a separate subsistence and in addition they denominated things of this sort as the ideas of entities wherefore it occurred to them almost for the same reason that there exist ideas of all things which are predicated universally and this assumption is just as if one desirous of reckoning a particular sum when in fact the component parts were fewer in number should consider it an impossibility to do so but when he had made them more numerous should succeed in counting them for more numerous so to say are forms than singulars that fall under the notice of sense from an investigation into the causes of which did these speculators advance from sensibles to ideas for a form is a thing that is of the same import with a sensible singular and it subsists independent of substances and forms are there in the case of many other things namely both in these particular things and in those that are eternal further in the modes in which it is demonstrated that forms exist according to none of these is it apparent that they really do exist for from some of them it is not necessary that a syllogism should arise but from certain others and in the case of things where they do not suppose that there are forms in existence of these are there generated forms 
For, according to the rational principles that may be adduced from the other sciences, there will subsist forms of all things of whatsoever there are sciences, and, according to the notion of the unity that is involved in plurality, will there subsist forms also of negations, and, according to the perception of something belonging to what has been corrupted, will there be forms of things subject to corruption, for of these is there a certain impression on the mind. But further, with respect to the most accurate of the arguments that have been brought forward in favor of the ideal theory, certain speculators, no doubt, make ideas to belong to relatives, of which they do not affirm that there is an essential genus, whereas others assert the existence of a third man. And, in general, the arguments concerning forms overturn the very things which those persons who maintain the existence of these forms would desire to exist, in preference to the existence of the forms themselves. For it happens that the duad is not first, but that the number is, and, prior to this, is that which is relative, and that which involves an essential subsistence is prior to, and this will be the case with all those things whatsoever which certain philosophers in their adherence to these opinions respecting forms have put forward in opposition to first principles further according indeed to that supposition by which these speculators affirm the existence of ideas not only will there be forms of substances but of many other things besides for there is not only the one concept about substances, but also concerning those things that are not substances, and there will be systems of scientific knowledge conversant not about substances merely. But there are innumerable other consequences that ensue unto this hypothesis, in accordance, however, with what is necessary, and with the opinions that are prevalent concerning the ideal theory, on the supposition that the forms are participants, it is expedient that there should be ideas of substances merely, for these do not participate according to what is accidental, but it is requisite that they should participate of each thing so far forth as there doth not exist a predication of it, of a subject. Now, I say, for example, if anything participates of the twofold itself, this also participates of what is everlasting, but according to accident, for it is an accident for the twofold to be everlasting. Wherefore, forms will constitute substance, and these here and there are in their signification equivalent to substance. Or, can we say that there is any existence of anything independent of these? Take the case, for instance, of the notion of unity involved in that of plurality. And, surely, if one establish that there is the same form of the ideas as of those things that are participants of them, there will subsist something that is in common to both. For why, may I ask, in the case of corruptible duads, and of duads that are many, I admit, in number yet everlasting, why, I say, in the case of these, is the duad one and the same thing, rather than in the case both of this and a certain particular duad? If, however, there is not the same form of these, the result would be, that entities would be homonymous, and the case would be just as if one should call both Callias and a piece of wood a man, though at the same time unable to discern any point of communion between them. If, however, we shall establish that other things, now I mean common reasons, are capable of adaptation to the forms, as, for instance, a plain figure to the circle itself, as well as the other portions or the definitions of the circle, and if that also to which it belongs will be annexed in addition, if all this be done, we ought to institute an inquiry as to whether or not this may be entirely an ineffectual proceeding. For also, to what it may be asked, will the addition be made, whether to the centre, or to the surface, or to all the parts? For all things that are involved in substance constitute ideas, for instance animal and biped. Further, it is evident that it is necessary that a thing itself should be something, in the same way as a surface must be some nature or other which will be inherent in all the forms, as is the case with the genus. End of chapter 4 of book 12 
Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards. Chapter 5 of Book 12 of Metaphysics by Aristotle. Translated by John McMahon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Edwards. Chapter 5. But, most especially, might one raise the question as to what at all it is that forms contribute either to the things that are eternal amongst those that fall under the notice of our senses, or to things that are being generated and corrupted. For neither are these a cause to them of any motion, or of any change whatever. But, certainly, neither do these forms render any assistance towards the advancement of the science of other things, for neither are those the substance of these, for in such a case they would be inherent in them, nor do they contribute to the existence of anything at all, inasmuch as they are not at least inherent in those things that are participants, for if they were so, they might perhaps seem to be equivalent with causes, as in the case of what is white, when it has been mixed with what is white." But, undoubtedly, may this reason be very easily overturned, a tenet to be sure, which Anaxagoras, in the first instance, and, subsequently to his age, Eudoxus, and certain other speculators from time to time, maintained whilst laboring under doubts. The theory itself, however, I say, is capable of refutation, for it would be easy to collect together many antagonistic arguments, as well as many impossible consequences, in reference to such an opinion. But the fact is, that neither do other things subsist from the forms according to any of the modes which are accustomed to be put forward by the advocates of the ideal hypothesis. And the assertion that ideas are models, or exemplars, and that other things participate in these, is, to speak, quite at random, and to assert what is tantamount with mere poetic metaphors. For what, allow me to ask, is that which operates, having an eye, so to say, or looking towards the ideas? For anything whatsoever admits of coming into existence, and of being generated, and yet there is no consequent necessity that it should be a thing that is modelled after some form or image, so that even though we should suppose Socrates to exist, and not to exist, there yet would be generated some such thing as Socrates actually is. And in like manner is it evident that this would be the case, even though Socrates were eternal. Also, will there subsist many paradigms or models of the same thing, so that this will hold good of the forms likewise, as in the instance of man, animal and biped will subsist as forms in conjunction also with ideal man. Further, not only will the forms constitute the paradigms of sensibles, but also those of themselves, as genus might be regarded a paradigm of species that are generic. Wherefore, the exemplar and the image will be the same thing. Further, it would appear an impossibility that substance, and that to which the substance belongs, should be separate. Wherefore, how would ideas which are said to constitute the substances of things involve a separable subsistence? In the Phaedo, however, is an assertion made to this effect. I mean, to the effect that forms are the causes both of existence and of generation. Nevertheless, on the supposition of the existence of these forms, entities, notwithstanding, are not being produced, if also there should not subsist something that is likely to be an efficient cause. And to this we may add that different other things are generated, as a house and a ring, of which they do not say that there are forms at all. Wherefore, it is evident that those things also, of which these advocates of the ideal theory say that there are ideas, may both exist and be generated on account of such causes as we may consider the things also to be that have been just now mentioned, but not on account of forms. But, certainly, 
as far as regards the subject of the ideal hypothesis it is possible both in the manner now adopted as well as by means of arguments that are more logical and accurate to collect together many similar points with those that already have been made subjects of inquiry chapter six now since we have thus far arrived at some settlement of the controversy concerning these upholders of the ideal theory it is well once more to examine into the consequences in respect of numbers that happen in the systems of those who assert that they are substances that involve a separable subsistence and the primary causes of entities it is necessary however on the supposition that number constitutes a certain nature and that there is not any other substance of it but this very thing as certain affirm it is i say undoubtedly necessary in this case that something belonging to it should be classed as what is primary whereas that something as consequential to this be in every instance different in form and this directly resides either in monads and then every monad whatsoever is incapable of comparison with any monad whatsoever or all of these are directly in order consequent and any whatsoever are comparable with any monads whatsoever as scientific men affirm to be the case with mathematical number for in mathematical number there is no difference as regards any monad one from another or shall we say that as far as the monads are concerned that some of them are capable of comparison with one another whereas some are not just as if the first duad were to subsist after unity and next in order the triad and so therefore another number but the monads in each number are capable of being compared one with another as the monads contained in the first duad are with themselves and those in the first triad with themselves and so therefore is it in the case of the rest of the numbers those monads however that are contained in the duad itself are incapable of comparison with those that are contained in the triad itself and the case is the same with the other consecutive numbers wherefore also the mathematician reckons two after the one along with the one before another one and after the numeration of the three in addition to these two he subjoins another one and the rest in like manner but this philosopher i mean plato after the one reckons two others without the first one and the triad without the duad and the case stands the same with the other number or shall we say that one sort of numbers should subsist as that which has been mentioned first but another such as the mathematicians put forward and a third which has been spoken of as last further it is evident that these numbers are either separable from things or are not separable but are resident in objects that fall under the notice of our senses yet not in these in such a manner as we have considered at the first but as subsisting in sensibles through inherent numbers or at any rate one kind of these must have a subsistence thus and another not so or all of them must exist thus the modes indeed therefore according to which it is possible that these should exist are necessarily only these in general however those philosophers who affirm unity to be a first principle and a substance and element of all things and that number derives its existence from this and from a certain other one almost each of them has declared his adherence to some one of these modes with the exception of that one where all the monads are assumed as being incapable of comparison one with another and this has happened consistently with rational principles for it is not admissible that there should be further another mode of the subsistence of number beside those that have been enumerated some therefore assert that both are numbers and that one of these modes which involves what is antecedent and what is subsequent accords with ideas but that mathematical number is different from ideas and sensibles and that both ideas and mathematical number possess a separable subsistence from sensibles 
whereas others assert that mathematical number only it is that is the original of entities, and that it has been actually separated from sensibles. And the Pythagoreans say that there exists the mathematical unit, but not one which has been separated, but they affirm that sensible substances consist from this. For the entire heaven they construct out of numbers, with the exception of those that are not monadic numbers, but they suppose that the monads involve magnitude. Yet, as to how the first unit consists, possessed of magnitude, they seem to be involved in perplexity. A certain other philosopher, however, affirms that the first number is that one which ranks amongst forms, and others say that mathematical number is this first number. And in like manner also is it the case in regard both of lengths and surfaces, and in regard of solids, for some say that those which are mathematical are different from those that subsist after ideas. But in the case of those who say otherwise, some, it is true, speak of mathematical natures even mathematically, as many, I mean, as do not constitute the ideas as numbers, or say that the ideas exist. But others speak of the mathematical number, yet not mathematically, however, for what they maintain is this, that neither is every magnitude divided into magnitudes, nor that any monads whatsoever can compose a duad. All speculators, however, with the exception of such of the Pythagorics, as assert that unity constitutes, as it may be said, an element and first principle of entities, seek to establish the dogma that numbers partake of the nature of monads. Yet, those undoubtedly speak of monads as involving magnitude, as has been stated previously. In what number of ways it is admissible, therefore, that statements should have been made respecting numbers, and that all such methods have been enumerated, is evident from these foregoing assertions. All these assertions, however, are, to be sure, impossible, but perhaps one more than another. Chapter 7 In the first place, then, we must examine whether monads are capable of mutual comparison, or are incapable of such comparison, and, on the supposition of their being incapable of comparison, whether they are to be viewed in the manner that we have divided. For, indeed, it is possible that any monad whatsoever should not admit of being compared with any whatsoever. And it is possible that those monads that are resident in the actual duad should not be capable of a comparison with those that are in the actual triad, and so therefore that those be incapable of comparison with one another which are contained in each primary number. If, therefore, all the monads are capable of comparison, and devoid of any mutual difference, mathematical number, and one number alone, come into being, and it is not admissible that ideas should constitute number. For what sort of a number will an ideal man be, or an ideal animal, or any other species whatsoever? For there is one idea of each, as one idea of man himself, and of animal itself there is another one. Numbers, however, that are similar, and devoid of difference, are infinite. Wherefore, in no respect will this triad constitute ideal man more than any other one whatever. On the supposition, however, that the ideas are not numbers, neither is it possible that these exist at all. For, from what first principles, may I ask, will the ideas be derived? For, number is derivable from unity, and the duad, which is indefinite, and these are said to be the first principles, and the elements of number, and it is not admissible to arrange them in classes, either as prior or subsequent to numbers. If, however, monads are incapable of comparison, and incapable of comparison after this mode, so that everything whatever is different from everything whatever, neither is it admissible that this can constitute mathematical number, for, in fact, mathematical number is derived from monads which are devoid of difference, and things that are demonstrated thereby are found to harmonize with monads of this description. Nor yet can this number belong to forms, 
for the first duad will not be derived from unity and the indefinite duad. In the next place, the consecutive numbers, as it is affirmed, are duad, triad, tetrad, for at the same time are the monads produced, which are contained in the first duad, whether after the same manner as the philosopher was for maintaining who first made the assertion of their subsistence from unequal monads, for from things reduced to a state of equality they have been actually produced, or whether they have a subsistence in another way. In the next place, on the supposition that there will be one monad that is prior to another, it will also be prior to the duad that is derived from these. For in case of the subsistence of anything, there is something prior and something subsequent. Likewise, will that which subsists from these be a thing that is antecedent to the one, but subsequent to the other? Further, whereas this actual unity is first, then doth there belong a certain first unit to the others, and a second after that, and again a third, there will be a second, of course, after the second, and a third after the first one. Wherefore, the monads would be antecedent to the numbers of which they are composed, as, to give an instance, in the duad there will reside a third monad antecedent to the existence of the number three, and in the triad a fourth, and in the tetrad a fifth, before the existence of these numbers. No one, indeed, therefore, of these aforesaid philosophers, hath asserted that the monads are incapable of comparison after this mode. But, in accordance, to be sure, with the principles of those speculators, it is reasonable that the case should be even so, though, according to reality, such is impossible. For also, that monads should be prior and subsequent is reasonable enough, provided there may be in existence both a certain first monad and first unit, and that in like manner also this should be the case in regard of duads, on the supposition that there is a first duad likewise. For, after that which is first, it is rational and necessary that there should be a something that is second, and if a something that is second, a third and so, therefore, of the rest in order. At the same time, however, to assert the existence of both, even the existence of a first monad, and of a second after unity, and of a first duad, this is impossible. But they introduce a monad, I admit, and a first one, but no longer do they bring forward a second and a third, and they introduce a first duad, but no longer do they bring forward a second and a third, but it is evident also that such is not admissible on the supposition that all the monads are incapable of comparison. I mean, that an actual duad and a triad, and so the other numbers, should have a subsistence. For whether the monads be devoid of difference, and whether they are severally different one from another, it is necessary that number be reckoned according to addition, as, for instance, the duad by the addition of one to another one, and the triad by the addition of another one to the two, and the tetrad in like manner. Inasmuch as these things, however, are so, it is impossible that there should be a generation of numbers after this mode, that is, in the same manner as certain speculators generate them from the duad and from unity. For the duad becomes a portion of the triad, and the triad of the tetrad, and in the same manner does it happen in the case of those numbers also that follow next in order. But from the first duad, and from the duad that is indefinite, is formed the tetrad, being two duads in addition to the actual duad. But on the supposition that the actual duad is not a portion, there will exist still another single duad, and the duad will be derived from unity itself, and another one. And if this be the case, it is not possible that also an indefinite duad should constitute the other element, for it produces one monad, but not a definite duad. Further, beside the actual triad and the actual duad, how, may I ask, will there exist other triads and duads, and in what manner are they compounded of prior and subsequent monads? For all these assumptions are even fictitious, and it is impossible that there be a first duad, then an actual triad, 
and it would be necessary that this should be the case on the supposition that unity and the indefinite duad will constitute elements of numbers. If, however, consequences that are impossibilities ensue, it is likewise impossible that these should be first principles. If, indeed, therefore, the monads are different, any one whatsoever from any one whatsoever, these and such other results necessarily ensue. But if the monads that are resident in another number are different, and others that are inherent in the same number are alone devoid of any such mutual difference, even in this case not a whit the less do consequences ensue that are attended with difficulty. As, for instance, in the decade itself are involved ten monads, and the decade is composed both of these and of two pentads, since, however, the decade itself is not an ordinary number, and since it is not compounded of ordinary pentads, as neither of ordinary monads, it is necessary that the monads should involve a mutual difference, I mean, those that are contained in this decade. For if they do not involve this difference, neither will the pentads be different of which the decade is composed. Yet, since they do involve this difference, the monads likewise will differ. And on the supposition that they differ, whether does it follow that there will not be inherent different other pentads, but merely those two, or that there will be inherent such? And if we do not suppose this to be the case, namely, that they will be inherent, it is absurd. Or, if they will be inherent, what sort will be the decade that is composed of those? For there is not another decade resident in the decade beside itself. But assuredly also it is necessary that the tetrad, at any rate, be not compounded of the ordinary or casual duads. For the indefinite duad, as they say, receiving the definite duad, has produced two duads. For it causes the duad it has received to become two. Further, the existence beside the two monads of the duad as a certain nature, and of the triad beside the three monads, how, may I ask, is such admissible? For one will either partake of the other, as a white man beside white and man, for he partakes of these, or will do so when the one amounts to a certain difference of the other, as man beside animal and biped. Further, some things are one in contact, and others by mixture, and others by position. Not one of which is it admissible should be inherent in the monads from which the duad and the triad are compounded. But, just as two men are not one certain thing beside both, so it is necessary also that the case should stand with the monads. And they will not be said to differ, because they are indivisible, for on this account also are points indivisible. But, nevertheless, the duad of them will not be anything different from the two. But, undoubtedly, neither should this escape our notice, that it happens that there will exist prior and subsequent duads, and in like manner doth the case stand with the rest of the numbers. For, indeed, even allowing the duads to rank in the tetrad, one along with another, yet these are antecedent to those in the octade, and they themselves have produced, as the duad has these, the tetrads that are contained in the octate itself, so that if, also, the first duad be an idea, these likewise will constitute certain ideas. And there is the same reasoning applicable to the case of the monads also. For the monads in the first duad produced the four monads that are in the tetrad, wherefore all the monads become ideas, and an idea will be compounded of ideas. Wherefore it is evident that those things of which the ideas themselves happen to be compounded will be composite natures, just as if one were to say that animals are compounded of animals. If there are ideas of these, ideas will be compounded of animals. And, in general, to make monads to involve a mutual difference of any kind whatsoever would be an absurd and fictitious supposition. Now, I mean by fictitious a thing that is forcibly contrived so as to suit a particular hypothesis. For, neither according to quantity nor according to quality do we see a monad differing from a monad, and it is requisite that every number should be either equal or unequal but particularly that which is monadic. 
Wherefore, if it be neither greater nor less, it will be equal. But things that are equal, and in short, devoid of mutual difference, we consider to be the same in numbers. And if this be not admitted, neither will there be in this decade duads that are without a difference, seeing that they are equal. For what cause will one be able to bring forward who makes the assertion that they are devoid of this mutual difference? Moreover, if every monad and another monad make two, a monad which is taken from the duad itself and the duad which is taken from the triad itself will be derived from monads that are different. And the question may be put as to whether this duad will be antecedent to the triad or subsequent to it but there appears to exist a greater necessity for its being antecedent. For the one subsists along with a triad, and the other along with a duad of monads. And we, indeed, in general, are inclined to adopt the supposition that one and one are two, even whether they may be equal or unequal, as, for instance, what is good and what is evil, and man and horse. They who make assertions in this way do not make these assertions of the monads, however. But if the number belonging to the triad itself be not a greater number than that belonging to the duad, it is astonishing. Or, on the supposition of its being greater, it is evident that there is an equal number also in the duad. Wherefore, this will be without a difference from the duad itself. This, however, does not admit of taking place if there is a certain first number and a second number. Neither will the ideas be numbers. For this very assertion do they correctly make who think that the monads should involve mutual differences, since they will constitute ideas, as has been previously stated. For the subject of both will be one form. But if the monads do not involve this difference, both the duads and the triads will be indifferent likewise. Wherefore, to the authors of this assertion, it is necessary to say that in counting one, two, in this way, we must not, beside what is previously existing, make any additional assumption of anything. For neither will there subsist generation from the indefinite duad, nor is it possible that an idea can exist, for there will be one idea inherent in another, and all forms will be parts of one. Wherefore, consistently, I admit, with their hypothesis, do they make their assertions, yet upon the whole, they do not make their assertions even consistently with their hypothesis. For they overturn many things, since they are likely to say that this itself at least involves a certain doubt, namely, whether, when we count and say one, two, three, we additionally assume anything in counting, or whether we carry on our reckoning according to parts. We do so, however, in both cases. Wherefore, it would be ridiculous to reduce this into so great a difference of substance. End of chapter 7 of book 12 Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards Chapter 8 of Book 12 of Metaphysics by Aristotle Translated by John McMahon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards Chapter 8 In the first place, however, above all, it is well that we should come to some final distinctions as to what the difference is between a number and a monad, if there is any difference at all. Now, it is necessary that this difference exist either according to quantity or according to quality, yet neither of these appears to be admissible. But, so far forth as number is concerned, the difference subsists according to quantity. And, therefore, if monads likewise differ in quantity, one number also would differ from another number, though it may be equal in the multitude of the monads. Further, may we ask whether the first monads are greater or less, and whether they may subsequently increase, or the contrary. For all these statements are irrational, but undoubtedly neither is it admissible that they should differ according to quality, 
for it is not possible that there should reside subsequently in them any passive condition, for also they say that there inheres in numbers quality subsequently to quantity. Further, neither would it happen unto them that this should be derived from unity, nor from the duad, for the one is not quality, whereas the other partakes of the nature of a constituent of quantity. For of the existence of many entities is the actual nature of them a cause. But if, then, this subsists after a certain manner differently, we must declare that this is the case likewise in the most eminent degree with a first principle, and we must come to some final distinction respecting the difference of the monad, namely that it is especially a necessary one, and why there exists a necessity that this should be the case. If monads, however, do not differ in quantity, nor yet in quality, what difference can speculators assume as existing in them? That indeed, therefore, on the supposition that ideas are numbers, it is admissible that all the monads neither should be capable of comparison, nor should be incapable of comparison, one with another, in either of these ways. This point is evident. But, assuredly, after the manner in which certain other philosophers make statements respecting numbers, neither are such assertions made correctly, and these are such as do not consider that there are ideas in existence, neither simply considered, nor as being certain numbers, but lay down the existence of mathematical entities, and contend that numbers are most original amongst entities, and that actual unity constitutes a first principle of them. For it would be absurd to go on the supposition that unity should be something primary amongst the units, as those persons assert it is, but that a duad should not be something primary amongst duads, nor the triad amongst triads, for all such points rest on the same reasoning. If, indeed, therefore, the assertions in regard of number may be viewed after this manner, and if one will seek to establish that mathematical number exists solely, unity, in such a case, does not constitute a first principle of numbers. For it is requisite that unity, such as this is, should differ from the rest of the monads, and, if this be admitted, there will necessarily exist a certain first duad that is different from the other duads, and, in like manner also, will it be so with the rest of the numbers, I mean, such as are consecutive. If, however, unity constitute a first principle, there subsists the greater necessity that the case should stand, just as Plato used to say, the points regarding number were disposed, and that there should exist a certain first duad and triad, and that numbers should be not capable of comparison with one another. But, on the other hand, if any one again should maintain these assertions, it has been declared that many impossibilities ensue. But, certainly, it is at any rate necessary that the case be either in that way or this way. Wherefore, on the supposition that it be in neither way, it would not be admissible that number should involve a separate subsistence. It is evident, however, from these statements, that the third mode is expressed even in the worst manner. I mean, that one which makes out that the number which belongs to forms, as well as mathematical number, are the same. For it is necessary that two errors, at the same time, should concur with one opinion. For neither is it possible that mathematical number should subsist in this manner, but as regards a person indulging in peculiar hypotheses, it is necessary that he should be prolix, and that he should enumerate the consequences also, whatsoever they are, which ensue unto those who denominate numbers as forms. This is requisite likewise. But the plan of the Pythagorics partly, no doubt, involves fewer difficulties than the statements that have been previously made, but partly it involves certain different difficulties peculiar to itself. For the constituting number as that which possesses a subsistence, not separable from sensibles, removes many of the impossibilities. But the assertion that bodies are compounded out of numbers, and that this number is mathematical, is impossible.
For neither is it correct to say that it constitutes individual magnitudes, and in the next place, because in the most eminent degree they are disposed after this mode, the monads at any rate do not involve magnitude. And how is it possible that magnitudes should be composed of things indivisible? But assuredly, mathematical number at least in its nature is monadic, yet those persons say that entities constitute number. At any rate, their speculations do they try and harmonize with bodies, as if numbers were derived from those. If, therefore, it is requisite, on the supposition of number being something essentially belonging to entities, that some one of those modes that have been mentioned should exist, but it is not admissible that any one of these should exist, it is evident, then, that there doth not subsist any such nature of numbers as those furnish who constitute number as that which possesses a separate subsistence. Further, might the question be asked, whether does each monad consist from the great and the small equalized, or whether is the one monad from the little and another from the great? If indeed, therefore, the case stands thus, neither will each number consist from all the elements, nor will the monads be devoid of mutual difference. For in this monad will be inherent the great, and in that the small, being what is in its own nature contrary. Further, how are those resident in the triad itself? For one of them is uneven. But perhaps on this account they make actual unity in what is uneven a mean. But if each of the monads arises from both the elements equalized, how will the duad constitute one certain nature compounded from the great and small? Or what difference will there be in this from the monad? Further, the monad is antecedent to the duad, for when it is taken away, the duad is taken away. Therefore, it is necessary that this be an idea of an idea, being at any rate antecedent to an idea, and that it has been produced prior to such. Of what, then, will it be? For the indefinite duad would be formative of duality. Further, it is necessary that, certainly, number be infinite or finite, for speculators make number to be that which involves a separate subsistence, so that it is not possible that the other of these should not subsist. That, therefore, it is not possible that it should be infinite is evident, for neither is infinite number odd, nor is it even, but the generation of numbers is invariably either of an odd number or of an even. When unity in one instance falls upon an even number, an odd number is produced, and when the duad in another case falls upon the even, that which is from unity is rendered twofold and when it falls in a third way upon the odd numbers, another even number is produced. Further, if every idea belongs to some particular thing, but numbers are ideas, infinite number also will be the idea of something, either of sensibles or of something else, although neither does this admit of taking place according to position, nor according to reason, but philosophers arrange the ideas after this manner. On the supposition, however, that number is finite, how far in point of quantity does it extend? For it is requisite that this should be declared, not only that the fact is so, but also why it is so. Undoubtedly, however, if number extends up to the decade, as certain say, in the first place, of course, will forms fail quickly. As, for instance, if the triad constitute ideal man, what number will ideal horse be? for every ideal number reaches up to the decade. Therefore, it is necessary that certain numbers exist of those residing in these, for these are substances and ideas. Notwithstanding, however, they will fail, for the species of animal already will be superabundant. At the same time, it is, however, evident that if the triad in this way be ideal man, the rest of the triads likewise will be so. For similar are those that are inherent in the same numbers. Wherefore, will there exist infinite men? If indeed every triad constitutes an idea, each man will be an ideal man. But if not, yet at any rate, men will be so. And if the smaller belong as a portion to the greater, namely, 
that which is of the monads that are capable of comparison as a portion of those that are in the same number and if the tetrad itself be an idea of anything as of a horse or of what is white man will be a part of horse if man constitutes a duad but absurd also is the supposition of there being an idea of the decade but not of the end decade nor of the numbers consecutive to this further however there both exist and are generated certain things of which there are not forms wherefore the question comes to this on what account are there not forms of those also in such a case the forms do not constitute causes moreover it would be absurd to imagine that number as far as the decade should be a certain entity in a greater degree and a form of the decade itself although there is no generation of this as of an unit but of that there is philosophers attempt however to alter their opinions as if the supposition were true that number up to the decade were a perfect one they generate at any rate the things thereon following as take the case of vacuity proportion the odd and other things of this kind within the decade for some things they ascribe to first principles for example motion rest good evil but other things to numbers wherefore unity amounts to what is odd for if it is resident in the triad how will the pentad constitute what is odd further how far do magnitudes and as many such bodies as there are partake of quantity for instance the first indivisible line next a duad and next those numbers up to a decade further on the supposition that number involves a separate subsistence one might feel a doubt as to whether unity were antecedent or the triad and the duad as far forth therefore as number is compounded unity is antecedent but as far forth as what is universal and is form are prior number involves an antecedent subsistence for each of the monads constitutes a portion of number as matter but the other as form and no doubt in one way is the right prior to the acute angle because it has been limited by its definition and in another way is the acute prior to the right because it is a part of it and the right angle is divided into the acute undoubtedly indeed as matter the acute angle and the element and the monad are prior and again as in reference to form and substance such as subsists according to definition is the right angle prior and so with the entire which is compounded of matter and form for both are more proximate to form and to that which definition belongs unto but in generation are they subsequent how then may i ask is unity a first principle because it is not they say divisible but is indivisible both that which is universal and that which is particular and that which is an element but in another manner is unity partly that which subsists according to definition and partly that according to duration in what way then does unity constitute a first principle for as has been declared both the right angle seems to be antecedent to the acute and the acute to the right and each is one therefore in both ways do speculators constitute unity as a first principle but further is this impossible for the one subsists as form and substance and the other as a part and as matter for in a manner each one in reality subsists in capacity if at least number is one certain thing and not as an aggregate heap but different number subsists from different monads as they say and each monad does not subsist in actuality a cause however of the error which ensues is this that they are accustomed at the same time to pursue their investigations from the mathematical sciences and from universal definitions wherefore from those no doubt as a point have they established unity and the first principle for the monad is a point without position as therefore certain others also have compounded entities out of what is least so do these persons likewise.
wherefore the monad becomes the matter of numbers and at the same time is prior to the duad and again is it subsequent to the duad existing as a certain whole and as an unit and as species on account however of their being engaged in investigating that which has been predicated universally as an unit they in this way also have spoken of it as a part but it is impossible that these should reside in the same subject at the same time but on the supposition of its being necessary that unity itself should subsist merely without position for in no respect is there a difference save that it constitutes a first principle and that the duad is divisible whereas that the monad is not so if this be the case the monad would be more similar to unity itself but if the monad alone be without position unity will be more similar to the monad than to the duad so that in either case each monad would be prior to the duad these speculators do not say so however at least they generate the duad first further on the supposition that the duad itself is a certain unit and the triad itself both constitute a duad from what then may i ask does the duad itself consist chapter nine but one might also feel perplexed since contact likewise has not an existence in numbers but that which is consecutive has in regard of whatsoever monads there is not to be found a medium as those that are in the duad or the triad whether what is consecutive is to be found in unity itself or not and whether the duad be antecedent to those things that are consecutive or anything whatsoever to the monads and in like manner also concerning the subsequent genera of number do these difficulties ensue both in the case of a line and surface and body for some inquirers make lengths from the species of the great and the small for instance the lengths as it were from the long as well as from the short but surfaces from wide and narrow and bulks from what is profound and low and these are species of the great and the small in respect however of the principle that subsists according to unity have different persons in different ways sought to establish their opinions upon points of this description and in these also appear innumerable statements that are both impossible and fictitious and which are contrary to all suppositions that are rational for also it happens that they are severed in their connection one with another unless likewise the first principles are concomitant so that there should exist what is broad and narrow and long and short and if this be admitted the surface will constitute a line and that which is solid a surface further however angles and figures and such like how will they be assigned and the same consequence ensues unto the points respecting numbers for these are passive states belonging to magnitude but magnitude is not a passive condition belonging unto these as neither is length of straightness and what is curved nor solids of what is smooth and rough common however to all these assumptions is that which is allowable as a subject of perplexity in the case of species viewed in reference to genus when one may admit the subsistence of universals namely whether animal itself may reside in animal or there be something therein that is different from animal itself for on the supposition that this is not separable it will not create any doubt but on the supposition of its being separable as the persons who make these statements affirm it would not be easy to decide the question of doubt respecting unity and respecting numbers and if such be not easy it is necessary to say what is impossible for when any one understands unity as involved in the notion of the duad and in general in that of number the question arises whether does he perceive a certain actual thing or something else some therefore generate magnitudes from matter of this description but others from a point but a point seems to them not to be an unit but to involve some similar quality with unity and to belong to a different matter such as multitude belongs to but which does not belong to multitude 
respecting which not a whit the less it happens that one feels the same doubts for if in fact the matter is one the same thing will be a line and a surface and a solid for from the same things will be derived that which is one and the same thing but if the matters are many in number and there will exist one matter of a line and another of a surface and another of a solid assuredly they will follow one another or they will not so that the same consequences will ensue likewise in this view of the case for either the surface will not involve a line or it will constitute a line further how it is admissible that number should subsist from unity and plurality there is no attempt made to show yet howsoever therefore they happen to frame their statements they encounter the same difficulties as those who make number to consist from unity and from the duad which is indefinite for one indeed generates number out of that which is predicated universally and not out of a certain multitude but the other from a certain multitude yet from that which is primary for they say that the duad is a certain primary multitude wherefore there is no difference so to speak discoverable in all this but the same doubts will follow whether we assume it to be mixture or position or temperament or generation and whatever things of this kind there are but one might especially inquire supposing that each monad is one from what does it subsist for undoubtedly each will not constitute unity itself at least but it is necessary that it be derived from unity itself and from plurality or from a portion of plurality the assertion therefore that the monad constitutes a certain multitude is impossible since at least it is indivisible but the assertion that a monad is from a portion of multitude involves many other difficulties for it is necessary also that each of the portions be indivisible or that it constitute multitude and that the monad should be divisible and that unity and the multitude should not be an element for each monad is not from multitude and an unit further the person who puts forward this assertion does nothing else than make another number for multitude is a number of indivisible things moreover also it is worthy of inquiry in respect of those who make assertions in this way whether number may be infinite or finite for as it appears the multitude was also finite out of which and unity finite monads were produced and multitude itself is different from infinite multitude what sort of multitude then and what sort of an element is unity and in like manner might one inquire also respecting a point and the element from which they make magnitudes for there is not merely at least one actual point therefore at any rate one might ask the question from what each of the rest of the points will ensue for undoubtedly it is not from a certain interval at least and an actual point but assuredly neither is it admissible that indivisible portions constitute the portions of an interval as they do of the multitude from which the monads consist for number is composed of things that are indivisible but this is not the case with magnitudes now all these statements as well as others of this kind render it evident that it is an impossibility for number and for magnitudes to possess a separable subsistence moreover the discordancy of the original framers of this theory respecting numbers is an indication that these things not being true are fraught with sources of confusion unto them for some of this school constituting mathematical natures merely in addition to those that are cognizant by the senses when they came to perceive the difficulty and fiction attendant upon forms have withdrawn their assent from the ideal or formal number and have introduced mathematical number in its stead but others wishing to make forms to exist at the same time with the numbers but not discerning in what manner on the supposition of one's admitting these as first principles mathematical number will subsist independent of that which is ideal have constituted ideal and mathematical number as the same in definition since in point of fact at least mathematical number has been done away with in this hypothesis for they introduce peculiar theories of their own and such as are not consistent with mathematical science
The philosopher, however, who first sought to establish the existence of both forms and numbers, in obedience to the dictates of reason, assigns a separate subsistence to forms and mathematical entities. Wherefore it happens that all of this sect express themselves correctly in a certain respect, no doubt, yet not entirely with correctness and themselves likewise acknowledge so much as being persons who do not make the same statements at all times but such as are contrary with one another and a cause of this is the following that their suppositions and first principles are false but it would be difficult from things that are not properly disposed in regard of truth and falsehood to frame an hypothesis with correctness according to epicharmus for in this case as soon as the assertion is made immediately also is apparent that which is not properly disposed in the before-mentioned respect regarding numbers however let thus much suffice of the questions that have been started and of the definitions and distinctions that have been framed for a person who has been brought to a state of acquiescence in a theory would still the more be induced to yield assent from the force of more numerous arguments but nothing further will prevail towards inducing persuasion in the case of one who has not been prevailed upon to yield his assent already with respect however to first principles and first causes and elements whatever assertions those persons put forward who are engaged in framing their distinctions in regard of a substance merely cognizant by the senses some of these indeed have been declared in our treatise on physics but the remainder of them are omitted seeing that they do not belong unto the plan of inquiry proposed to be pursued in our present work but whatever assertions are made by those who affirm that there exist different substances independent of those that fall under the notice of our senses this is a subject for investigation consecutive to those statements that have been already made upon this point since therefore certain persons affirm that there are such like ideas and numbers and that the elements of these are elements and first principles of entities with respect to these we must inquire what it is they say and how they say it those philosophers then who are for constituting as such existences numbers only and such as are mathematical numbers are to form subjects for examination afterwards of those, however, who affirm the existence of the ideas, one should at the same time be able to perceive both the manner of their existence and the matter of doubt that is prevalent regarding them, for also do they constitute ideas as existing simultaneously with universal substances, and again they view them as involving a separate subsistence even from singulars. But that these statements are not possible has been previously made a matter of doubt a cause however of their connecting these substances into one and the same species i mean with those persons who call ideas universals is because they are not accustomed to constitute them as the same substances with sensibles some singulars indeed therefore that are involved in objects that fall under the notice of our senses they consider to be in a state of flux and not one of them to remain in a condition of permanence but that the universal subsists both beside these and is something that is different from them but as we have declared in the foregoing statements socrates communicated an impulse it is true to this inquiry by reason of definitions yet he did not really abstract them at least from singulars and in thus not assigning them a separate subsistence he formed his conceptions correctly and one could make this assertion evident from the actual occurrence of facts for without universals of course it is not possible to attain unto scientific knowledge but the abstraction of them from singulars is a cause of the difficulties that ensue in regard of ideas but some as if it were necessary that if there are certain substances beside those that are cognizant by sense and are in a state of flux they should involve a separate subsistence some i say were not in possession of other natures but brought forward those that are denominated universals so that it happens that both universals and singulars are nearly the same natures this to be sure then would itself amount to a certain essential difficulty in those statements that have been put forward above chapter ten what it is however that is attended with doubt 
both unto those who affirm the existence of ideas, and those who deny their existence, has likewise been observed previously in the doubts enumerated at the beginning of this treatise. Let us, however, at present, make a repetition of the statements made there. For if indeed one will not admit that substances involve a separate subsistence, and that the singulars of entities subsist in that manner as they are declared to do, such a view of things will overturn substance, as we are disposed to allow. Yet, should one assume that there are substances possessing a separate subsistence, how will he establish the elements and the first principles of them? For, supposing them to subsist as a singular, and not as an universal, entities of this kind will be as numerous as elements, and the elements will not be things capable of being made objects of scientific knowledge. For, let the syllables in a word be granted to be as substances, and let the elements of them be the elements of substances. In such a case as this, it is therefore necessary that B, A, be one, and that each of the syllables should be one, if not in fact universally, and the same in species, yet each must be one in number, and this certain particular thing, and not equivocal, and further they regard each one as the very thing itself. If syllables, however, be thus, so also will those things be of which syllables are composed. There will not accordingly be more than one letter A, nor will any of the rest of the elements be more than one, according to the very same mode of reasoning, in accordance with which neither is there any of the other syllables that is the same, but there is one in one word, and another in another. But certainly, if this be the case, there will not exist any different entities beside the elements, but entities will constitute elements merely and, further, neither will the elements be objects of scientific knowledge, for they are not universals, but scientific knowledge is conversant about universals as objects of investigation. Now, this is evident both from demonstrations and definitions, for a syllogism is not completed because this particular triangle has angles equal to two right angles, unless every triangle has angles equal to two right angles nor because this man is an animal, unless every man is an animal. But, undoubtedly, if first principles are universal, or, also, if substances that are compounds of these are universal, non-substance in such a case will be a thing that is antecedent to substance, for what is universal does not constitute substance, whereas the element and the first principle are universal. The element, however, and the first principle are things that are antecedent to those to which a first principle and an element belong, and therefore do all these consequences ensue reasonably, when both certain philosophers constitute ideas as out of elements, and when, beside ideas and substances involving the same form, they may be of opinion that there is some one thing that has actually a separate subsistence. If, however, there is no hindrance, but that, as in the case of the elements of speech, there should be a multitude of the letters A and the letters B, and that A itself and B itself should be nothing beside the multitude of these, on this account at least there will be infinite similar syllables. But the fact that all scientific knowledge is conversant about what is universal, so that it is necessary that both the first principles of entities should be universal, and not separable substances, this fact, I say, most especially, is attended with doubtfulness above any of the assertions already made. The assertion that is made is, notwithstanding, in a manner true, and in a manner it is not true, for scientific knowledge, as also the act of scientific cognition, is twofold, of which one subsists in capacity, but the other in energy. Capacity, then, I mean, that which subsists as the matter of that which is universal, and is indefinite, belongs to what is universal and indefinite. The energy, however, being definite, is likewise this certain particular thing, belonging to this certain definite particular thing. But according to accident it is that the power of vision beholds universal color, because this particular color which it beholds is a color, and 
what the grammarian speculates into as this particular letter a is a letter a since if it be necessary that the first principles should be universal it is also necessary that those things which subsist from these should be universal as is shown in the instance of demonstrations and if this be the case there will be nothing that involves a separate subsistence nor will there be in existence actual substance it is evident however that in a manner scientific knowledge is conversant about what is universal as an object of its investigations but that in a manner this is not the case end of chapter ten and end of book twelve recording in memory of mitchell edwards Chapter 1 of Book 13 of Metaphysics by Aristotle Translated by John McMahon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards Chapter 1 Respecting indeed, then, this substance, let thus much suffice to have been spoken but that all constitute first principles as contraries as we have observed in our physics this is also the case in like manner respecting immovable substances if it is not admissible however that there should be anything prior to the first principle of all things it would be impossible that the principle being anything else should be the first principle of all things as if one should say that a thing that is white was a first principle, not so far forth as it is something else, but so far forth as it is white, and that this, notwithstanding, belonging to its subject, is white, and is something different at the same time, for that will be antecedent. But, certainly, all things are generated from contraries, as from a certain subject. It is requisite, then, that especially this should take place in contraries, Always, therefore, will all contraries belong to a subject, and none of them will be separable. But, as also it appears, nothing is contrary to substance, and reason certifies to the truth of this statement. Not one, therefore, of contraries is strictly a first principle of all things, but a principle that is different from these. Some, however, make one of the contraries as matter, certain of them on the one hand constituting the unequal as contrary to unity that is to equality as if this were the nature of multitude but some on the other hand making multitude or plurality contrary to unity for numbers are generated by some no doubt from the unequal duad i mean the great and small yet a certain philosopher generates them from plurality by both however this is done from the substance of unity for the person who says that the unequal and the one constitute elements but that the unequal as a compound from great and small constitutes the duad speaks of inequality and greatness and smallness as if they were one and he does not clearly determine that they are so in definition but not in number yet certainly even the first principles which they call elements they have not correctly furnished an explanation of some speculators amongst them introducing along with unity the great and the small affirm that these three are elements of numbers the two first as matter but unity as form yet according to others the much and the few are elements because the great and the small are naturally more peculiar properties of magnitude but according to the systems of others elements are things that are more universal in the case of these i mean the exceeding and the exceeded there is not after all any difference however between them so to say in regard of certain consequences that ensue unless in respect of logical difficulties merely which they try to guard against by themselves introducing logical demonstrations nevertheless it rests on the same mode of reasoning at any rate namely the assertion of the exceeding and the exceeded being first principles but not the great and the small and that from the elements number is prior to the duad for both are more universal 
but now do they make an assertion of the one, but do not make an assertion of the other. Others, however, have opposed diversity and difference to unity, but some introduce as principles plurality and unity. But if entities, as they are disposed that they should be, are generated from contraries, but to unity either nothing is contrary, or if then there is likely to be anything, it is plurality, and if the unequal is contrary to the equal, and the diverse to the same, and the different to the same, if all this be the case, most especially are those persons who oppose unity to plurality in possession of a certain opinion that may be urged in their defence. Nor, however, have even these speculators adequately proved their hypothesis, for unity will constitute what is fewness, for plurality is opposed to paucity, but the much to the few. Now, as regards unity, that it signifies a measure is evident, and in everything is there something different that may be classed as a subject, as in harmony the diocese, and in magnitude a finger or foot, or something else of this description, but in rhythm the basis or syllable. And in like manner also, in weight, there is a certain definite standard of measure, and according to the same manner also it is with all things in qualities there is found a certain definite quality but in quantities a certain definite quantity and that which is indivisible constitutes the measure for one sort of measure subsists according to the form and another according to sense so that there does not exist any substance that is essentially one and this assumption rests on what is in accordance with reason for unity signifies that it constitutes a measure of a certain plurality or multitude and number that it is plurality measured and a multitude of measures wherefore also it may be concluded reasonably enough that unity is not number for neither is the measure a standard of measure but a first principle and the measure and unity it is necessary, however, always, that measure should subsist as something that is the same in all things, as, for instance, if a horse is the measure, that such should be horses, and if a man, men, but if man, and horse, and a god are measures, they will perhaps be animal, and the number of them will be animals, but if man, and white, and walking be such, by no means of these will there be number, from the fact of all subsisting in one and the same subject according to number. Yet, nevertheless, there will exist a number of the genera of these, or of some other such category. But those who make the unequal as a certain unity, but the indefinite duad from great and small, put forward an assertion very far from the truth of things that are apparent and possible, for these are both passions and accidents, rather than subjects of numbers and magnitudes. For the much and few constitute passive states of number, and great and small of magnitude, just as even and odd, and smooth and rough, and straight and curved. Moreover also, in addition to this error, it is necessary likewise that the great and the small, and all things of this kind, should be relatives. But relation least of all the categories, constitutes a certain nature, or substance, and is subsequent, both to quality and quantity, and is a certain passive condition of quantity, which subsists in relation to something, as has been declared, but does not constitute matter, or anything else, and, in general, subsists in regard of what is common in relation to something, and in the parts and species of this. For there is nothing that is either great or small, or much or few, and in short, which subsists as a relative, which is not much or few, or great or small, or a relative, at the same time that it is something else. That relation, however, in the smallest degree, constitutes a certain substance, and a certain entity, is indicated by the fact of their belonging to it alone neither generation nor corruption, nor motion, just as with respect to quantity there is increase and diminution, with respect to quality, alteration, with respect to place, motion, with respect to substance, generation simply and corruption. 
but this is not the case with respect to relation for without being put in motion at one time it will be greater and at another time less or equal so far forth as the other is put in motion according to quantity and it is necessary that the matter of everything should be such as the thing itself in capacity wherefore also will this be the case with the matter of substance but relation constitutes substance neither in capacity nor in energy therefore it would be absurd nay rather impossible the constituting non-substance an element of substance and a thing that is antecedent to it for all the categories are what is subsequent but further elements are not predicated as elements of each of the things of which they are elements but the much and few both separately and simultaneously are predicated of number and the long and the short of a line and a surface is both broad and narrow but if doubtless also there exists a certain multitude of things to which always there belongs something indeed that is few as for example the duad for if this were much unity would constitute fewness and if it were much absolutely it would be much after the same manner as the decade and if this be not the case it will be more than this nay even than ten thousand how then will number on supposition of the foregoing in this way consist of few and much for either both ought to be predicated or neither but in the present instance only one of these is predicated chapter two but it is necessary absolutely to examine as to whether then it is admissible that things which are eternal should be composed from elements for they will in such a case involve matter for everything that is compounded of elements constitutes a composite nature if therefore it is necessary that a thing be generated from that of which it consists both if it exists invariably and if it were invariably generated but everything is generated from that which subsists in capacity i mean the thing which is being generated for it could not have been produced from that which is impossible nor had it any existence before it was generated but that which is possible admits of subsisting in energy and not of subsisting in this way now if this be the case that number also most eminently above all things always subsists or anything else that involves matter it would admit of non-existence just as that also which involves the space of one day and that which possesses any amount of years whatsoever now if this be so thus much will be true of time also when it is extended so as to be without limit there would not then exist things eternal since that is not a thing eternal which admits of non-existence as it has come in our way to treat of this subject in other portions of our philosophic discourses if that however which is now asserted be true universally that no one substance is eternal unless it subsist in energy and that the elements are the matter of substance there will not exist elements of any eternal substance from which as inherent this substance is composed but there are some persons who make an indefinite duad the element together with unity but as to the unequal they reasonably enough encounter difficulties on account of coincident impossibilities from whom so many merely of the difficulties are removed as necessarily arise on account of the making inequality and relation an element to those who make assertions in this way as many difficulties however as ensue independent of this opinion these it is necessary should exist for those also both whether they constitute out of them ideal number and whether they do so with mathematical number likewise many indeed therefore are the sources of the error with respect to these causes but particularly does this remark apply to the doubt prevalent downwards from antiquity for it appeared to the philosophers of ancient days that all entities will be one i mean entity itself unless one should adduce a solution of the doubt and at the same time would advance in the investigation in a line parallel with the theory of parmenides but there is a necessity for showing in regard of its existence that non-ends has an existence 
For in this way, out of entity and something else, will entities arise, supposing they are many. Although, in the first place indeed, will this be true if entity is denominated multifariously? For one entity signifies that a thing constitutes substance, and another that it is quality, and another that it is quantity, and so of the rest of the categories, therefore. What sort of one will all the entities in such a case be, if non-entity will not have an existence, whether will they be substances, or passive conditions, and other things truly, in like manner? Or will they constitute all things, and the one will be this particular thing, and such like, and so much, and such other particulars, as signify one certain entity? But absurd, nay, rather impossible, would be the assertion that one certain nature produced should be a cause, and that of this entity, and of the same entity, something should be this particular thing, and something else should be endued with quality, and that this should belong to quantity, and that to the place where. In such a case, may I ask, from what sort of non-entity and entity will entity subsist? For also multifariously is denominated non-entity, since likewise this is the case with entity, and non-man signifies that which is not this, and the non-straight, the not being a thing of this description, and the being not three cubits, that which does not possess this particular quality of measure. Of what sort, therefore, of entity and non-entity are many classes of entities? Now, an advocate of this opinion is desirous of asserting what is false, and of calling this nature non-entity, out of which, and entity, arise the many classes of entities that are generated. Wherefore also it was said that it is requisite that something that is false be supposed in the same manner as also geometricians allow, hypothetically, that a thing is pedal which is not pedal. And it is impossible that these things be so. For neither do geometricians suppose anything that is false. For that is not what is the object of the proposition in the syllogism. Nor are things generated, nor corrupted, from that which constitutes non-entity after this mode. Since, however, non-entity, according to its declensions, is styled in an equal number of ways with the categories, and, besides this, that is denominated non-entity, which subsists as what is false, and that which subsists according to potentiality from this generation takes place. From that which is not man, but man in capacity, is generated a man, and a thing that is white, from that which is not white in energy, but white in capacity. And in like manner is it the case whether both one certain thing is generated, and whether many are. The inquiry, however, appears to be as to how, quotes, ends, which is predicated according to substances, should constitute what is plural. For numbers and lengths and bodies are things that are being produced. Now, absurd is the inquiry as to how, indeed, entity, which constitutes the nature of some particular thing, is plural, and not also to inquire how it possesses either qualities or quantities. For, beyond all doubt, the indefinite duad is not a cause, nor yet the great and the small, that two things are white, or that there are many colors, or tastes, or figures, for these would be numbers and monads. But, really, supposing that they attended to these inquiries at least, they would have perceived also in them the cause, for the same thing, and that which is analogous or proportional, would constitute a cause for the actual deviation is a cause also of the opposition that is under investigation by them, as subsisting between entity and unity, from which, and from these, such persons seek to generate entities, and have adopted their hypothesis in regard of relation and inequality, because there neither exists a contrary, nor negation of these, but one nature of entities, as both this particular thing, and that particular quality. And one ought also to institute this inquiry, namely, as to how relatives are plural, but not single. In the present case, however, the inquiry is as to how there are numerous monads beside the first one, but they do not also further inquire how there are many unequals beside the unequal, 
although they employ and affirm the existence of the great, the small, the much, the few, of which numbers consist, the long, the short, of which length consists, the broad, the narrow, of which the surface is composed, the deep, the low, of which the bulks consist, and in this way further, they without doubt affirm the existence of as many species of relatives as they may introduce. What, therefore, let me ask, is the cause with these of their being plural? It is requisite, therefore, indeed, as we have affirmed, that entity in capacity should be supposed as subsisting in each of these. But by one who makes these assertions is this also evinced, namely, that this particular thing constitutes an entity in capacity, and a substance, but non-entity in itself, because it constitutes a relative, just as if he should speak of something of such a quality, which is neither unity nor entity in capacity, nor a negation of unity, nor of entity, but one certain thing, which is something belonging to entities, and much more will this be the case, as has been declared, if he prosecuted the inquiry as to the manner how entities are plural, not through the investigation as to the mode those things that belong to the same predicamental line constitute many substances, or many things endued with qualities, but how they are many entities. For some things are substances, but some passive states, and some relations. In the case, therefore, of the rest of the categories, the subsistence of plurality involves the matter also of some other investigation. For, on account of their not being separable, as the subject becomes, and is plural, and those things that are endued with qualities and quantities are plural likewise, although at least it be necessary that there should subsist a certain matter for every genus, save that it is impossible that it should involve an existence separable from substances. In the case, however, of those things subsisting as a certain particular thing, there is involved some reason in the inquiry how this particular thing is plural, if it will not be something particular, and this very particular thing, and a certain nature of this description. But, rather, does this doubt originate from hence, how quantities are many substances in energy, but not one. However, without doubt, even though this particular thing is not the same with that which is a certain quantity, it is not expressed how and why entities are plural, but how and why quantities are plural. For every number signifies a certain quantity, and the monad constitutes nothing else than a measure, because it is according to quantity what is indivisible. If, therefore, a quantity be different from that which subsists as a definite particular, from what it is that such definite particular results is not declared, nor how plurality subsists. But if it is the same, the person who makes the assertion supports many contrarieties. And one may also prosecute the inquiry as regards number, whence are we to obtain our confidence as to their existence? For in the doctrine of ideas, the idealists furnish a certain cause for entities, since each one of the numbers constitutes a certain idea. But the idea is the cause of existence to other things, in some way or other to be sure. For let this be assumed as a supposition of theirs. To one, however, who does not think in this way, on account of discerning inherent difficulties independent of the doctrine of ideas, the case is different, so that on this account at least he does not constitute them as numbers. But to one who introduces mathematical number, whence, may I ask, is it necessary even to have confidence in the existence of number of such a description, and in what respect will such be serviceable to other things? For neither does such a one say that it is the cause of anything who affirms its existence, but such a one asserts it as being a certain nature which involves an essential subsistence. Nor does it appear that it is a cause, for all the speculations of arithmeticians, as has been stated, will likewise have an existence as conversant with objects cognizant to our senses. Chapter 3 those, therefore, that posit the existence of ideas, and say that these are numbers, should make an attempt to inform us how and why they subsist, since, according to the exposition of each, every idea, 
constitutes one certain thing that is different from what we regard the many as being. Doubtless, however, since these things are neither necessary nor possible, neither is it to be affirmed that mathematical number exists separably on account of these at least. But the Pythagoreans, on account of their perceiving many passive qualities of numbers as subsisting in bodies cognizant to the senses, made entities to be numbers, I admit, not involving, however, a separable existence, but they regarded entities as compounded from numbers. And why so? Because the passive qualities of numbers subsist in harmony and in the heaven, and in many other things. To those, however, who maintain that mathematical number exists merely, nothing of this kind is it admissible for them to affirm, that is, if they follow their own hypothesis. But it was asserted by them, because of these will there not exist systems of scientific knowledge. We assert, however, that the case stands as we affirmed formerly, and it is evident that mathematical numbers do not possess a separated subsistence, for if they did, the passive qualities of those that have actually been separated would not have been resident in bodies. The Pythagoreans indeed, therefore, as regards a point of this description, are not deserving of reprehension in any way, but so far, however, as they constitute physical or natural bodies out of numbers, or, in other words, from things not possessing gravity, nor having lightness, things involving lightness and heaviness. So far, I say, they seem to speak respecting another heaven, and other bodies, but not of those that fall under the notice of our senses. Those, however, who constitute number as involving a separable subsistence, because axioms will not exist as inherent in objects cognizant to the senses, the assertions, likewise, of the existence of the other, that is, of the mathematical entities, will be true, and these serve to cause a soothing sensation in the soul, and they suppose that numbers exist and involve a separable subsistence, and in like manner is it the case with the magnitudes of the mathematicians. It is evident, therefore, that also the adverse argument will enunciate things that are contrary, and the point which just now has been declared a matter of doubt must be decided by those who speak in this way, namely, as to why, on the supposition of these things, not by any means being inherent in objects cognizant to our senses, the passive qualities of them should be insensibles. But there are some who, from the fact of the existence of boundaries and extremities, viz., from a point being the boundary of a line, and again a line of a surface, and a surface of a solid, imagine that natures of this description exist necessarily. Therefore, one ought also to discover, as regards this reason, whether it may not in reality be very weak, for neither are extremities substances, but rather do all these constitute limits or boundaries, since both of walking and in general of motion there exists a certain limit. Is therefore this limit some particular thing and a certain substance? But to indulge in such a supposition is absurd. Certainly, however, admitting that they have an existence, all of them would be found amongst those objects that fall under the notice of our senses, for the argument itself proclaims their existence in these. Why, then, will they involve a separable subsistence? But further, would one who was not very credulous investigate respecting, therefore, of course, every number and mathematical natures, as to why such as these, as are prior, contribute nothing to those that are subsequent? For, according to those who say that mathematical natures merely exist, though number should not have any existence, yet magnitudes will have a subsistence, and, though even these were not in existence, yet still would the soul exist, in such bodies as are cognizant to our senses. It does not, however, appear from the phenomena that nature is devoid of a connection with herself, just in the way that a vicious tragedy might be. With those, however, who are for establishing the subsistence of ideas, this, no doubt, escapes them, for they constitute magnitudes out of matter and number, from the duad, indeed, lengths, and from the triad, 
surfaces, perhaps, and from the tetrad, solids, or also from other numbers, for there is no difference. But whether, one may ask, will these exist at any rate as ideas, or what, pray, will be the manner of their subsistence, and in what way are they contributors to entities as to their being? For, as with mathematical entities, so do these neither contribute anything in that way. But, assuredly, neither of these doth there exist at least any theorem, unless one should choose to put in motion mathematical entities, and to create certain peculiar opinions of his own. But it is not difficult for those who put forward any description of hypotheses whatsoever to be able to be prolix and to speak without ceasing. Those, therefore, who cement together mathematical entities with ideas are in this way guilty of error. But the earliest amongst these speculators, having constituted two numbers, the one of form and the other of a mathematical nature, by no means either have declared, or would they be able to say, the manner how this is effected, and from what mathematical number will be compounded. For they make it intermediate between formal and sensible number. For if we suppose that it is composed of the great and small, the same will it be with that which is belonging to the ideas. But if from some other thing that is small and great, this will not be the case, for number produces magnitudes. But if he will speak of anything different, he will affirm the existence of many elements. And if the first principle of each thing constitutes a certain original unity, there will be in the case of these a something that is common, namely, unity. We must likewise investigate how, also, these many are one, and, at the same time, in regard of the fact that it is an impossibility that number should be produced otherwise than from either unity and an indefinite duad. Therefore are all these consequences irrational, and they are at variance both themselves with one another and with those statements that are reasonable, and there appears to be inherent in them the quote, long discourse close quote, of Simonides. For a long discourse is like that of the slaves, when no wholesome assertion is made. But also they appear with respect to those elements, the great and the small, to ball out as if they were being dragged away with violence. For by no means are they able to generate number without doubling that which proceeds from unity. But it is absurd, nay, rather, a certain one of the impossibilities of this system, to introduce generation in the case of entities that are eternal. As to the Pythagoreans indeed, therefore, they have no need to labor under doubt whether they do not introduce or do introduce generation, for they manifestly affirm that unity has been established, and that, accordingly, what is immediately nearest to the infinite, whether from surfaces, or from color, or from seed, or from such things as they are at a loss to declare, is so because it has been dragged forward, and bounded by a limit, or termination. Since, however, they frame cosmogonies, and wish to express themselves physically, it is just that they should institute some inquiry concerning nature, but as a departure from the present method of investigation, for we are engaged in the investigation of the first principles, belonging to things that are immovable. Wherefore also we must examine into the generation of numbers of this kind. End of chapter 3 of book 13 Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards Chapter 4 of Book 13 of Metaphysics by Aristotle Translated by John McMahon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards Chapter 4 They do not speak of the generation of the odd number, therefore, as if it were a thing evident that of the even there is in existence a generation, but the even, in the first instance, certain speculators constitute from unequals, I mean, the great and small equalized. 
it is then with them necessary that inequality should be prior to the equalization of these if however there always existed things in a state of equalization they would not have been unequal at a prior period for of that always existing there is not anything prior wherefore it is evident that it is not for the purpose of speculation that they make the generation of numbers it involves however a doubt and a subject matter for reprehension to one who acquires knowledge judiciously how disposed in respect of the good and the fair are elements and first principles the doubt i mean is as follows namely whether any of those is such as we are disposed to denominate the good itself and the best or whether they are not of this sort but are of subsequent growth for the difficulty appears to be acknowledged by theologians by certain amongst those of the present day who do not actually make an assertion of this description but who maintain that from the principle of progression found in the nature of entities the good and the fair make their appearance on the stage of creation this however they do cautious about falling into a real difficulty which ensues unto the systems of those who affirm as some do that unity constitutes a first principle of things but the difficulty to which i allude is not started on account of this namely their ascribing quote, the well close quote, to a first principle as a thing that is implanted in it but from the fact of their making unity a first principle and a first principle as an element and number as consisting from unity but the poets those of the early ages acted in a way similar to this so far as they assert the dominion and the rule not of these first principles such as night and heaven or chaos or even oceanus but of jupiter notwithstanding to these persons does it happen that they assert things of this description on account of their changing the dominative principles of the universe because those of these speculators that at any rate were for adopting principles of a mingled description and in respect of their not broaching their theories in a fabulous garb for example as phericides and certain others have in point of fact established quote, the best close quote, as the earliest principle of generation and this is the case also with the magi and with the sophoi or sages of a subsequent period such as both empedocles and anaxagoras one of whom constituted harmony as an element and the other made mind a first principle of things of those philosophers however who asserted the existence of immovable substances some i admit affirm unity to constitute the actual good they however in the most eminent degree regarded unity to constitute the substance of the good the matter of doubt of course therefore comes to this as to what way scientific men ought to express themselves on this subject it would however be surprising if in that which is original and eternal and most self-sufficient for its own subsistence this very original attribute i mean the self-sufficiency and the conservation of itself should not be discovered as that which constitutes what is good but undoubtedly not on account of anything else is it incorruptible or sufficient to itself than on account of its existence or condition of subsistence after an excellent mode wherefore indeed the assertion of the existence of a first principle of this description appears reasonable as far as its reality is concerned for this however to be unity or if not unity both an element and an element of numbers is impossible for much difficulty is coincident with an hypothesis of this kind and certain speculators in their attempts to avoid this have lost sight of the point in question when they acknowledged unity to constitute an original first principle and an element of things but a principle and an element of number however i mean mathematical number for supposing this to be the case all the monads would become a something that is good and there would exist a certain fair supply of things which are good 
further if forms constitute numbers all the forms will be such as some certain thing or other that is good notwithstanding let any one suppose the existence of ideas of any description whatsoever he feels disposed to admit for allowing that they are to be classed amongst things that are good merely ideas will not constitute substances but if also they are to rank amongst substances all animals and plants are good and the participants of these likewise now both do these absurdities concur with this hypothesis and what is contrary constitutes an element whether we assume it to be plurality or inequality and great and small will amount to what is an actual evil wherefore no doubt a certain philosopher avoided the connection of the good with unity as if on this hypothesis it would be what is contrary since generation arose from contraries that the nature of plurality should necessarily be evil some however affirm the unequal to be the nature of evil therefore do all these entities happen to have a share in what is evil except unity which constitutes actual unity and we find that numbers participate in a more unmixed state than magnitudes it also follows that evil is a place of the good and that it shares in and desires after that which is subject to decay of itself for one contrary is corruptive of another contrary and if it is the case as we have affirmed that matter constitutes everything that subsists in capacity as fire in capacity is the matter of fire in energy evil will constitute the good itself in potentiality now all these results concur partly in consequence of their constituting every first principle as an element and partly in consequence of their making contraries first principles and partly because they make unity itself a first principle of things and partly because they regard numbers as first substances and such as involve a separable subsistence and because they take the same view of the species or forms chapter five if therefore also the non-positing of the good in the rank of first principles and the positing it in the way we have alluded to be what is impossible it is evident that first principles are not correctly assigned nor the primary substances yet one does not form his opinions correctly either if he should assimilate the first principles of the universe to the principle belonging to animals and plants because from things that are indefinite and unfinished there arise always things that are more perfect wherefore also in the case of the primary substances they affirm that it happens in this way that neither does any particular entity constitute actual unity for in objects that are here that is that fall under the notice of our senses are the first principles perfect from which these objects derive their original for man begets man and the seed is not that which is first but it would be absurd also the making a place along with mathematical solids for the place of singulars is peculiar to them wherefore are they topically or locally separable mathematical solids however are not situated in any certain locality and the assertion that they will be situated indeed somewhere and at the same time not to say what the place is is absurd but it would become those who say that entities are compounded of elements and that numbers are the first of entities that they should by thus making a division as to how one thing derives an existence from another express themselves in such a way as to make us acquainted after what manner number originates from certain first principles whether this takes place by means of mixture neither however is everything that has undergone mixture different from that which is being produced and unity will not be a thing that involves a separable subsistence nor a different nature but they wish that it should be after this manner does number however we may ask subsist through composition as a syllable but in this case it is requisite that there should be position and he who employs his understanding thereupon will comprehend unity apart from plurality 
Number, then, will constitute this, that is, a monad, and plurality, or unity and inequality. And since that body, which subsists from certain entities, subsists partly as from things that are inherent, and partly that this is not the case, in which, may I ask, will number be found? For those things which do not subsist in this way, as from those that are inherent, are no other than those of which there is generation. Does it, however, then subsist as from seed? But it is not possible for anything to proceed forth from what is indivisible. Shall we say, however, that it arises from a contrary that does not involve a permanent subsistence? But whatever things subsist in this manner are also from something else that does possess a permanent subsistence. Since, therefore, as regards unity, one philosopher, in fact, posits it as a thing that is contrary to plurality, and another as what is contrary to inequality, employing unity as if it were equality. Number should, therefore, subsist as if it were from contraries. There will, then, be something else from which, as involving a permanent subsistence, a generation of the other is brought about. Further, why, then, at all, are the other things of this sort subject to decay, as many as have their existence from contraries? or wherein contraries are to be found. Why, I say, are they subject to decay, even though they may arise from everything, and yet that this be not the case with number? For, respecting this, nothing is declared, although a contrary, which is both inherent and not inherent, destroys that which is contrary to itself, as, for instance, discord, mixture, and yet, at any rate, such ought not necessarily to be the case, for the former is not contrary to the latter at least. There has been, however, no determination arrived at either as to the mode in which numbers are causative of substances and of existence, whether as limits, for example, points of magnitudes, and, according to the arrangements adopted by Eurytus, that a certain number belongs to a certain thing, as this number belongs to man, and that to horse, just as they who refer numbers to figures, the triangle and the square, thus assimilating the forms of plants to pebbles of calculation. Or shall we say that this is the case with the ratio, or the symphony, of numbers? And in like manner it is so as regards man, and everything else. But, as regards, then, the passive states, how, may I ask, are they numbers, such as the white, and sweet, and hot? That numbers, however, do not constitute substances, and that they are not causes of form, is plain. For reason, that is, the formal principle, constitutes substance. But number constitutes matter, as the number or substance of flesh or bone. In this way are there three of fire, and two of earth, and number, whatsoever it may be, is invariably of certain things, and constitutes either what is fiery, or earthy, or of the nature of a monad. Substance, however, is that which consists in being so much with relation to so much, according to mixture, but this no longer constitutes number but a proportion or ratio of the mixture of corporeal numbers, or certain other things. Neither, therefore, does number constitute a cause in respect of production, nor does it as number exist at all, nor as such number as is of the nature of a monad, nor as matter, nor as the formal principle, and the form itself of things. But, undoubtedly, neither does it constitute that on account of which a thing subsists, I mean, of course, the final cause of things. Chapter 6 One, however, might also doubt what, quote, the well, close quote, is which originates from numbers, if mixture is to be found in number, either in that which is rational, or in that which is odd. For now would nothing more conducive to health arise from water, and honey being thrice three times mingled. 
but it would be of more service in that way supposing that there were to subsist no proportion in the condiments but that it be watery or in number that which is an unmixed entity further the ratios i mean those belonging to the mixtures consequent upon the addition of numbers are not found in numbers themselves as the ratio between three and two is that of three colon two not thrice two however for there ought to be the same genus in the multiplications wherefore it is necessary that both by the a should be measured the order in which the a b g is to be found and by the d that which d e z will assume wherefore there must be the same measure in all things therefore there will be of fire b e g z and of water the number twice three but if it be necessary that all things should participate of number it is requisite likewise that there should be a concurrence of many things that are the same and that there should be the same number for this and for another is this thing therefore a cause and on account of this is there anything that is done or is it obscure such for instance as is a certain number of the revolutionary movements of the sun and again of those of the moon and the life and age of each of the animal creation at least what obstruction then i may ask is there to some of these being square but others of them cubical and equal to each other and others twofold for there is no hindrance to this but it is necessary that they be intimately connected with these if all things are wont to participate in common of number and if it should be admissible that things which differ from each other should fall under the same number wherefore if the same number happens to be found in certain things those will be the same with one another having the same form of number as sun and moon will be the same having the same numerical form but why are these causes of things there are seven vowels no doubt and seven chords or harmonies and seven pleiades and within seven years some animals cast their teeth some at any rate do so and some do not and seven in number were those warriors that undertook the famous expedition against thebes is it then the case because such a particular number is naturally suited for such purposes that on this account either those chieftains amounted to seven or that the pleiades consist of seven stars or were the quote, septum contra thebes close quote, so on account of the gates of thebes or through some other different cause if however we reckon in this manner and assign twelve stars to arcturus at least yet others agree in assigning a greater number since x y z they affirm to constitute symphonies and that because those are three these also are three but that there may be ten thousand things of this sort no one in the least feels any concern for g and r would be one sign but if because each of the others is twofold but another is not so now the cause is inasmuch as there being three places one in each is added to s on this account there subsist three only but not because there are three symphonies since there are at least more symphonies than three yet in the present instance there cannot any longer be more than three now these philosophers also are not unlike the ancient interpreters of homer who discover minute but fail to observe important similitudes certain speculators however assert that there are many such like particulars as for instance even as regards media one medium is nine whereas another is eight and a verse of seventeen feet is equal in number to these now they say that the verse ascends on the right in nine syllables but in eight on the left and that the distance is equal both in letters from a to z 
and in musical instruments from the most grave sound to the most acute the number of which constitutes an equality in the all various melody of the heaven one ought not however to observe things of this kind for no one would entertain a shadow of doubt as regards them nor ought we to make any assertions concerning them nor to attempt to discover them in things that are eternal since also they are to be discovered in things that are subject to corruption those natures however in numbers that are the subjects of applause and the things contrary to these and in general those that fall under our notice in the mathematical sciences as some in fact affirm them to be and constitute them as causes of nature appear to persons at least who view the matter in this light to escape their notice for according to no one of the modes of those that are defined respecting first principles is any of them causative and yet they do make manifest that point namely that quote, the well close quote, has a subsistence and that to the coordination in the case of the fair belong the odd the straight the equal the powers of certain numbers for at the same time subsist seasons and such a particular number and other things therefore of this sort such as they gather from mathematical theorems these all involve this power or capacity wherefore also they seem like unto casual coincidences for they are accidents no doubt yet all are appropriate to one another the analogical however is one for in each category of entity is there the analogical as the straight in length is analogous to the even in superficies to perhaps the odd in number and in colour to the white further numbers which are in the species do not constitute causes of things harmonic and the like for those that are equals in the species differ from each other for likewise do the monads differ wherefore on account of these things at least we must not constitute them species as regards the consequences indeed then that ensue both these and even still more than these can be collected they appear however to furnish a proof of the fact that the supporters of the ideal hypothesis fall into many errors respecting the generation of them and that in no way can a connection be traced in their systems inasmuch as mathematical species do not involve a subsistence separable from sensibles as some affirm nor do these constitute the first principles of things end of chapter six end of book thirteen and end of metaphysics by aristotle translated by john mcmahon read by Geoffrey Edwards, proof listened by Guero, meta coordinated by Guero, recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards.